over my life, I really never wanted to do chitas and never did it much at all, just because of the way in which I experienced it being demanded of me. Just right. because the way in which um, it felt to me, together with a whole bunch of other, uh, you know, chassidish stuff, or that it was like some kind of like rite of passage, or that that somehow made me a good chassid. Uh, you know, there was a long time, long time where actually I would go to the oil and just say to the rabbi, I don't know who you are, hmm. and I don't know what you want, but I know I should be here. Welcome to Homesick for Lubavitch, a podcast where we explore Lubavitch identity in the year 2024. My name is Ben Siafson, and I will be your host. Let's begin. Alrighty, as you can hear, we are here in Crown Heights. We are here in Crown Heights, in the mean streets of Crown Heights, with the beeping. That's a sphere of music in the background for you. That's acapella, acapella music. That definitely does not give it anybody any joy. <laughs> or maybe it does, I don't know. I don't understand New Yorkers anymore. I don't even think I do. Maybe it does give them joy. The fellow sitting across the table from me is smiling. He seems to have a lot of joy, even though he lives in Brooklyn. And uh, out of everything about you, that, that may be the most intriguing. <laughs> Yeah, I'm smiling because I'm with you. Uh, I'm touched. Anyway, I'm here with Fitz Raven. Um, I don't think we went to yeshiva together at any point. I don't no. remember you in yeshiva, but you're you know close enough to me in age that I know plenty of people that know you. Um, and uh, you know, been following each other's paths, or seeing where each other has been going the past few years. Um, Fitz is a master cipher. Or was a master cipher for many years. Emeritus. Emeritus, um, and he taught many people Safros. Um, there was a time in my life that I was very interested in the letters. Mm. Uh, I think we spoke about it once, but uh, the whole part of the letters. But I never became a safer, but that itself was uh, enough to kind of point me towards you. And uh, today... No, you, today once, you once reached out curious about the intersection between consumerism and religion, right? it, the way people buy... That was Sifra later on. Tyra and do lavish was, parties around it and stuff like that. No, no, that, okay. I mean, that that sounds like I'm a like I'm a socialist or Marxist um, Green Party. No, that, that that was a separate thing. That was not to do with the letters. That was a few years ago, and maybe one day we will make that doc. Um, I think what it was was we were talking. I don't know why we were talking. We we're talking about something else, and then we had a conversation about. Why is Safra so expensive? Mm. Like, why is Amazusa so expensive? And you started telling me, you think it's expensive, it's subsidized, it's right. cheap. Right, Like, you started, you laid out the numbers of, you know, if you have a guy who needs to not live it up, but just to pay his bills. Certainly in, in Brooklyn. Anywhere in America, <laughs> yeah. from what I remember. The numbers, yeah, but Brooklyn for sure, right? And you were explaining how, like, you know, just if you break if you break it down, a, a person who keep writes consistently like a machine, the numbers just don't add up, and so. Well, a, a big part of it is also is not it's not even possible to write consistently like a machine. Most people can't write eight hours a day. You know? But I'm saying even a okay, so let's say not eight hours a day, but meaning a person who doesn't slack, a person who writes as much as is possible, right, and isn't lazy, because God knows that, you know. In other professions, they're not lazy at all, <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. And they don't take any, and, and they don't take lunch breaks in the office. But I'm saying, like, even if someone who, 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 you know, is very, very earnest about it and 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 and, and puts in the hours, simply will not will not um, will not be able to make a living. And that to me was fascinating, and that got into a conversation about um, the spike of uh, the price of mezuzas because say from a to Sifriteria. So, yeah, especially during COVID and post COVID, right. a lot of things changed. So that that was fascinating to me because it, it it was a microcosm of so many interesting topics. You know, the topic of inflation at the time, the topic of um, you know, spiritual consumerism, or like religious commerce, right? No, but spiritual consumerism, were like you know, 
I'm going to indulge in a safer terror kind of thing. Or like you, right. you see a shift where like the upper class or as wealth kind of diverges and the rich get richer, which is across the board what's happening in this country. Um, you know, so there's more money to spend up there. And so the safer terror industry becomes in a way more prominent than it was in the past and kind of what would be the word in economics displaces mm. the mezuzah industry and causes yeah they call it displacement i well, think that was that was a big one especially after covid sifritaria exploded right yeah but in a, in many ways the most interesting thing about it was you know okay now that we're talking i gotta make this doc okay we'll talk about it afterwards we gotta make this doc <laughs> right we'll make a documentary yeah no, because to me, the most interesting part of it is that, you know, the world talks about the shift to digital, digital, digital and AI now and like, oh, you could you could render. And there's something about the fact that like there is this, like, I'll be tired, there's this need to certain things have to be made by hand. And it's not and this is where we're really talking about then. It's not enough that they're made by hand. They have to be made by hand by someone like you. And that, in so many ways, goes against. I don't know if capitalism per se. What but do you mean by someone like you? Meaning like a fellow like, Jew, right? Someone who's obligated in the mitzvah, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Someone who's raising a family like you. You know, without getting too grub about it, mm. right? You cannot. You cannot um, out. You cannot uh, outsource it. And uh, there's a better word for it. My English today is not great, but you cannot. You cannot. Uh, you you cannot delegate it. No, no, you cannot outsource it to to China or India. You know, find a country where right. people have a completely different history than you, and therefore different rules of economics, and say, okay, for a buck, you'll make me a mezuzah. You cannot do that. You have to go to a fellow yid. Okay, I understand that yid in Eretz Yisrael will will do it for less than yid in America, but only a certain amount less, right? You, you're not going to ever be able to. You certainly can't give it to a machine, right? And so, in many ways, that runs so counter to the way capitalism, I know I'm sounding like a Marxist now, but... Scaling. No, no but yeah, exactly. Capitalism is all about scaling, like commoditizing everything to the... Like, how do I make this thing scalable? You know, and in many ways, that's something that hits my line of work, too. Where, like, you know, how do you make storytelling scalable? And the answer is, you don't. Mm. Storytelling that's scalable is... Right, it loses it's, its quality, it evaporates. Yeah, it's what you find in the Judaica store today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a... Okay, end the podcast, bye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mic drop, boom. Homesick for Lubavitch is brought to you by Uvla Media, which, yes, is my video production company. At Uvla Media, we believe in the same principles as this podcast, namely that in our communities, there are just so many stories worth sharing and worth telling, and that in the end, a good story is always so much more. Over the past few years, we have helped dozens of nonprofits, companies, and families share their very precious stories with the community. If you're looking to share your story, please don't hesitate to reach out to us for a free consultation at hello at uvlamedia.com. Again, that's hello at uvlamedia.com. A link can be found below as well. For now, let's get back to the podcast. Yeah, anyway, I've been talking a lot. Okay, so why don't you... So By the way, that happens a lot in this room. That I talk a lot? <laughs> no, people talk a lot. Yeah, so why don't we, So getting to that point, so yeah, I got carried with the doc. Um, we'll do it, we'll do it, God willing. And now it's public, I have to do it. So you were a cipher, you, now you're no longer practicing cipher. Why don't you talk a little bit about that, like where you are now and how you got here? Hmm. No, I'm a full-time professional life and leadership coach. Okay. I work with people to help them create their dreams, what they desire for their future, for their purpose. Um, how did I get from from sophras to coaching? Is that your question? Well, it's, it's interesting because sophras was a childhood dream of mine. Talking about dreams, you know. Right. Um it was a childhood dream of mine since I'm like four or five. I don't know if I shared it with you when we were talking about the Oasis of Aleph base, but I was absolutely fascinated. Books like Mezuzah Land really inspired me. Do you know that book? 
Um, it just came back to print recently. Anyway, when I was a kid, it was there was this book, and it was a land, and it really inspired me. It, it depicted a cipher, a very sagacious looking, full of serenity and light. Right. <laughs> it, did, it did the job. You what know? happened? The man? book did the job. What happened? <laughs> um, and and other books also that would have like images of the Alf being the safer Torah, the crowns on the letters. I was I was right. absolutely enamored and fascinated by by Sofers, and it was a childhood dream. And then I became a cipher beginning at age 14, actually, um, which I, I don't recommend, which is why I don't teach guys that are that young, actually. Why, why don't you recommend it? Um, because um, Safros, first of all, it's very halacha heavy. Mm. Um, you, you have to, there's a, lot, a quantity of halacha to right. be proficient in. But also, some of the halachas are, are quite distinct. And and very um, and not popular at all. A lot of people don't know anything about the, the nuances, the intricacies of the halachas that govern the, the field of Islam. Right. And some of them are hard to understand. Literally, right. the way they're brought in the Shulchan Aruch, or even in the Altar Rebbe Shulchan Aruch, they leave a lot of questions. Uh, right. There seem to be some inconsistencies in the holes. Like if you're trying, so it's it's laborious to be proficient in the halacha. Right, fourteen-year-old usually getting into the craft is more excited about the calligraphic. Well, how do you say calligraphic elements of it, or the artistic elements of it, or whatever? Or even if he's drawn to this, uh, you know, to it for from some place of inspiration, or you know, sincere piety or something. But it's 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 govern. You know, it's a it's a field of halacha. It's not a hobby, is what you're saying. Right. It's a cra- so, it's a very very serious craft. Right, and I, and I know from myself that that was hard for me as a 14 year old to fully align myself with the right. way in which this is not the fun and game. Like this, yes, right. the craft is one dimension of it, but there's what to really master and understand. That was hard. Right. It takes discipline. It takes maturity. Right. So for that reason, you know, generally speaking, I I prefer to teach only guys you know that are older. But I learned then it was interesting. Do you, st- you still teach them? I have a couple of students this year, but I'm. On my way out of, yeah, of that, out. Well, yeah. especially there's another program that opened up that's you know mm-hmm. a colleague of mine is heading and and, and taught to, uh, teaching many people including online so, uh-huh. <clears throat> um, and I've created a video course as well. I see. At least on the OCS. So I, there's other aspects of the skill like carving the quill and how to hold right. it, but at least on the way I build the OCS of the Altair Kazal, which is a unique, a very unique niche and. I've acquired a reputation for doing that very well, so I've turned it into a video course so people can access that from around the world and and you know future generations as well can benefit from that. Mm-hmm. But at, at 14 I learned, and it was actually interesting because my older brother was the one who got my parents to, to hire the local cipher uh, in Detroit where I grew up to to tutor him in Safras like over a summer. As your older brother was also into Safras? Initially. And I said, I want to be part of that class. I want to be, and my, and, and my, and my brother was like, no, you, you always think you know everything. And I can't say that he was wrong, but he didn't want me there. He thought I would just be an obstruction, you know? So I said, okay, fine. If, if I'm going to do that, then I'll be kicked out of the class, you know? In the end, I became the slaver and he didn't. Uh-huh. Um, and then, you know, I just, but people would ask me my whole life, so you're going to be a slaver when you grow up? And I, I was never able to answer that question definitively. I was never able to say, oh, yeah, absolutely. That's what I'm going to be. Interesting. Never. There was always some awareness in me that, like, I love Safros. I'm fascinated with them. Not just the craft and the Altrebis Ksav in particular, which is beyond elegant and, and, and special. But also the Halacha. I've, I've, I'm very drawn to this stepson of Halacha, so to speak, you know. I call it a stepson because most Rabbanim are not proficient in it and yeshivas don't learn it. It's, it's very unique. I'm very drawn to it. I'm fascinated by every country's achrin in Simul Lamed Beis, right. uh, which doesn't have any commentary whatsoever. How about the shapes of the letters <coughs> or more the halachas of writing as everything? The halachas of writing, the process of writing. Right, not the shapes. No, Hekif Gvil, Choktoiches, Kassidron, these fascinating, interesting conversations. Right. So, uh, but I never, I kind of never felt like yeah, this is what I'm I'm going to be. This is what I'm going to do. It never felt like that. Interesting. It became like that. You know, I was in my young 20s and I was, this is what I had to do and I was getting better and better at it. So it became some bread and butter for me. But it, it never, I never identified with it as... I'm a cipher. I'm a cipher. Hmm. Even, even 
even in the last bunch of years, um, I say I practice STOM. Uh, when I created branding, I called it Craft Sofa. Like I was always like trying to like come up with some creative um, new way in to like speak of of this work and of this craft because it was something about I'm a sofa that just didn't fully align for me. Interesting. Yeah, I mean the identity with what you do is a very is a very complicated question. I feel. Um, you know, I think Chassidus talks about it. It's ringing a bell now. I'm forgetting now. Is it Shema Pu'ula and Shema Payal or something like that? Or Shema Tayar? Where only certain people... There are many people who are like described as an adjective. Like, this is what he does. Right? He's a safer craftsman. Like, he's a safer craftsman. That's what he does for a living. Very few people are described as a Shema Tayar. Like, he is a safer or I think like with Gibur, like, you know, people have Gvura, but very few people are a Gibur, right? It's very hard to make that jump from something that you do becoming who you are. Um, and very few people find it. Um, so in general, I think, in general, I think it's a, it's a complex question. And the, I think that, you know, the, the first question is, is it necessarily a good thing to fully identify with what you do, Right. Um, you know, th there is a lot of romanticism around, you know, those stories of like, I knew I was a drummer from the day I was born, right. or you see it a lot in art, but you also, you know, I knew I was going to be a doctor from the day I was born. And there's a lot of romanticism around that. But sure. first of all, is that, is that really even a possibility for most people? Like it's possible that that's just a fluke. Um, I think there's also a lot of revisionism there. When someone is successful at something, they kind of rewrite their whole history that, of course, everything led up to this, obviously. Um, but, you know, even if it's totally true, one wonders if it's, if it's really, if it's necessarily a positive to, to identify fully with what you do. And you know, because this podcast is about uh, Lubavitch, you know, I think the extra kind of oomph to that question is that, like, Lubavitch, at least f for a long time, it was pretty straightforward that, yes, you are a shliach, you do shlichus. So you do shlichus, but not only you do shlichus, you are a shliach. Yes. And so that kind of fully totalizing identity, you know, where, like, you, what you do is everything that you are, you sleep it, it became a norm, and, you know, so in many ways, what that does is that anybody who doesn't accept that kind of role, for whatever reason, feels like they need to because that's the way you live. Like, the same way that guy's a shliach, I need to be a cipher. Like, it needs to be full. But I, I wouldn't say that that's the source of that. I think a lot of people, Lubavitch, not Lubavitch, Jew, Gentile, uh, the, the discourse in, in Western civilization, in Western society, right. is to identify your accomplishments right. with your worth. You're what you do Absolutely. with your who you are. So I, 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 think, I said extra oomph. I didn't say, I didn't say it's like only a Lubavitch problem. But I would say, punk uh -huh. that actually the whole I am shliach context is a gift because anyone can borrow that. Like, let's say you're a professional. But if you're willing to expand your context and your view to say, I'm a shliach of the Ebeshter in this to this world, right. to do this and this for the betterment of society of the world. I'm a shliach of the Rebbe. I bring the Rebbe's ideas and teachings into my relationships at work. Then you can literally borrow the I'm a shliach, which is, which is so pervasive right. and profound and leaves no, it's airtight in terms of identity because of how connected it is with the Rebbe, with the Yechida HaKlolis, like with the essence of being a yid in this world, the way the Rebbe taught us and the way Chassidus teaches us. So then you can actually borrow that and like allow for whatever you're up to right. to fill you up on an identity level actually powerfully. Yeah. So I would actually see that as, as a gift, whereas if, you're, if you don't have that point of reference of being a shliach, right. then you, you are more 
pigeonholed. You know, that's what people meet each other. Oh, what do you do? What do you do? It's another right. way of saying, who are you? Yeah. Which is bizarre, right? No, but do you want to know how much money you have? <laughs> <laughs> but Lubavitchers have a certain edge. A person say, this is my shlichus. This is who I am. Because if you can associate it with shlichus, and you can get how right. this is fulfills on your purpose, and every year is fulfilling your purpose, right? right? That actually becomes very expensive. I, w- I wasn't trying to be critical of shlichus. I wasn't trying to be critical of shlichus. I, I I just think that it's you know whenever you whenever you talk about a general kind of condition or or problem or just question about like you said like connecting what you do with what your worth is, I think especially on this podcast, but in general, because it's a big part of my life, I like to see the extra or different element in it that comes from the Lubavitch experience. It doesn't mean to say that, therefore, it's a Lubavitch problem more than another problem. It doesn't mean to say that the shlichus is an issue. It means to say that, that it means to say exactly what, what, what was said, which is, I think that there is a, there is a sense and I think there is tremendous there is tremendous potential in in this in this idea that the your 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 idea of the world and your idea of this of your place in this world is totalizing, like you said, it's airtight, right? Um, there's no like like Chassidus doesn't give a space out. There's no space outside of it, not because it's. Not because it's uh, greedy, I don't think, but simply bec- or because it's jealous that, like, you know, you, you, there can't be someone else with any kind of... Or, or authoritarian. I don't think that's a vart. I think the vart is that, like, you know, when you, when you, when you develop a theology that, that, that starts, but, like, it starts from the Abishter, starts from the one creator... And it goes all the way to the individual without any dilution in between. You end up with something totalizing. It just it has to be that way. But it's also so. There's tremendous potential in that. It's divine, but it's also extremely demanding. And I think it does affect the way we look at ourselves in general. So even if you don't go on shlichus, you kind of expect a life where where everything makes full sense. The same way that it makes you see what I'm saying. Mm. Like I mean, I brought it up in a recent podcast where where Shliach once told me, "Is that my phone? That is my phone. Sorry. Do you want to cut this section out? No, it's just two seconds. Let me just let me just turn it off." Sorry about that. So, you know, I was I saying that shlichus. You're saying if there's what I'm hearing you say. Yeah. Tell me, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that if there's a break in the chain, right? Like you're not on shlichus, right? Then you a person could end up struggling a little bit more because they, they don't they kind of know about that to, that totality that possibility of totality, but there's a break in the chain, so they don't necessarily get to enjoy that as much. Um, no, no. Again, I, it sounds like I'm posing it as a problem. I, I think what what I'm saying, like, I was I was speaking to Shleich. I mentioned this on a recent podcast. I was speaking to Shleich, who told me, look, um, you know, when I I went on Shleichus, you know, with my wife, they, we both came from families that had businesses. I Meaning, we had an opportunity to go work for a family business, and our parents wanted us to come work for the family business. We made a choice to go on Shleichus, a very deliberate choice. And he's like, one of the beauties of shlichus is you make that choice once in your life, and then that's it. Mm. You don't have to choose again. There's something very totalizing about that. Yeah, that's not true for everyone. But uh, I understand. Mm. But a lot of sh- no, there is something like in the narrative of shlichus. That's how it is. You choose. You go to a city. There, especially he was old enough that he feels that there was sent. I don't know, maybe they actually did send him to that city. I don't know exactly. How- he was one of the first guys where it was literally, but you know, I'm sure he asked the rabbi for a bracha to go to that city. And so he feels like that's his shlichus. And that's it. doesn't have to make that question again of, am I going to be a shliach? Where am I going to have my shlichus? 
right? And so there's something very totalizing about that. Like, this is what your life is about. Um, yeah, so I, I feel like there is a... Um, it's interesting when you bring up, like, I want to be a safer. I, I'm probably reading too much into it. It's probably... It's probably like what any kid, you know, my daughter today, every day she wants to be something else, you know, <laughs> but I think there's a, I think there's an interesting, um, you know, thing there to consider, like about the Lubavitch, the Lubavitch need for, for. But it's interesting that you're calling it a need. See, I, I, I get that you're not complaining about anything. It's fine. But, but I think that you are saying something. Uh-huh. Which is actually like worthy of like actually pulling out and taking a closer look at. Because you mentioned before, and this to- this topic, I don't, maybe you didn't intend to go into this topic, but it's interesting because it's close to my heart. You said before the demanding nature of it, mm. which is interesting because I it, because um, to me, what's more present, at least conceptually, like maybe practically, like it's really demanding, like being on shulchis, right? But everyone in the world, everyone today is seeking meaning, is seeking happiness, is, is seeking, like, peace. Is, there, there's a certain equation that people are looking for. Right. To, to have the insanity of being alive in this world, let alone right. in this time. Right. I, and I say this time because I don't think that the anxiety and the distress was on the same level in previous times. It's a different anxiety, yeah. Okay. Um, so there's an equation that everyone's looking for. In, a, in, in so many ways, the totality of the, you know, Enel Movadoi, I'm a Shliach. Right. From Atmos and Mohos down to the, you know, lunch that you're having with the Balabas, um, is the lottery. You, you won the jackpot. You, you mm. can live in this world with, with that airtight, bulletproof clarity, confidence, certainty. That majority of the world is is chalishing to have that experience, right? And what's in so that's like to me that's the prize of it. What's interesting though is precisely because of the total nature of it, the very radical total nature of it. It, it for some people, it can be traumatizing. If it, you know, for some people, it can like. If it's not absorbed appropriately, right? Like, you know, if you water a plant, right? But the earth or the soil is not like set up to absorb it, then it just ends up flooding the thing and, and killing it. A message of such totality, a message of pure truth like that, sometimes can be received, right? Depending on the, the, the constellation of variables that make up the psychological, emotional, spiritual personality could be received as but where's me where, 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 the, the, the desire for individuality the desire for autonomy the desire for experience of a self can sometimes feel very threatened when you're born into a situation where before you even right. get to be right. autonomous and independent and have the question of what's the purpose and what's the meaning you're already told the truth's already been found right. for you <laughs> and it's like, and it's total. Right. So that, 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 that's, that's where I was going when you mentioned that. Fair, fair enough. That, that's not at all, though. I understand what you're saying, but that's not at all the binary that I'm talking about. Meaning the choice I'm talking about is not the, 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 the problem or the, yeah, the choice that I'm talking about is not to be yourself or not be yourself or to have individuality or not have individuality. There is such a choice. But per, to me, precisely... It, to be an individual in a totalizing um, way of looking at things, it must be demanding because there are many ideologies that are totalizing. By definition, ideologies are very are, are, ideologies are totalizing. They basically take an idea that's complicated and, and, and limited and they turn it into an entire worldview that allows you to live your like, to see the entire world. I mean, the, the famous kind of concept conception of it is, I think, Hannah Arendt's idea of, you know, the origins of totalitarianism, which is, 
ideology is how you basically simplify, you know, the world is complicated, it's confusing. So you come up with a very simple idea that, you know, kind of answers everything, whether it's today, sadly, we see a lot of anti-Semitism, but she was talking about communism and fascism. And like, you know, the whole world basically revolves around the very simple set of principles and that explains everything. And that has to, by its force and its nature, has to totalize, it has to include everything because that's its whole point is it explains the entire world. It, allow, it leaves no room for competing thought. What's the difference between that and what you talked about, you know, Chassidus? Right? You said people are desperate for, for well, clarity. Like, is that demanding? Oh, it's not demanding. <clears throat> that's a point. That's a point. It's not demanding. That, it, it's not demanding. It's, it's, it absorbs you. What it demands of you, if, if, if you can even call it demand, is basically obedience and just like, you know, acceptance. This is like, accept this, 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 this identity and we'll take care of you. Further than that, we will not demand. Right. So, so the impulse, the impulse to join that kind of totalizing worldview is not the impulse to accept a demanding way of life. It's fakert. It's a way out. As opposed to Yiddish character of Chassidus right, or so, Lubavitch. What Chassidus can be and should be is demanding. You know, but we have to be careful when we when like that, that's why that's why I insist on the word demanding. I, I don't mean it as a bad thing or like So you know, dem- say more about that. Because when people hear demanding they could they could hear something threatening. So say be- more of that about demanding and you don't mean it as a bad thing. Well, because in today's world what people want is they want a way out of the confusion of the world that has become so re- narcissistic and revolving around the individual. They, you know, let's let's take a step back. You know, the the world, as uh, okay, uh, I don't know if there's one theory that explains it all. That itself would be an ideology, right? But there's kind of an I think a common understanding today that as especially the Western world and the quote unquote modern world has become more uh, more prosperous and more comfortable, people's people's minds have been fixated less on their external needs of food and shelter and become more and more introspective and personal, right? Eventually leading to a point of many people consider narcissism, right? You know, the famous book, The Culture of Narcissism, was written in the 60s or 70s. It was, it was written many, many years ago. And the problem with narcissism, besides it being obnoxious, is that it hurts the person, and the person eventually gets goes crazy because he ha- he or she has to live with themselves the entire day, and that's unbearable. Right? There's no world around them. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a, it's a it's they live in a loop, right? Right. They're fundamentally I- inwardly they're not embedded within the context that they're meant to be. Yeah, they're 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 always they're 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 basically just revo- they're 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 they. they it's a circle. They they, they they constantly return to themselves. You're chasing your own tail. Chasing your own tail, right? To put it to put it nicely, right? And and so eventually you you just you need a way out, right? And so people want a way out. They want a way out of like you know yes I I, I wanted to be able to choose anything and everything, including my you know of course in the extremes my my gender, but even if I'm not going so extreme, my identity, my way of life, who I am, my authenticity. I want to be me. And it becomes an unbearable weight, and so like give me give me something to make me feel, like just you know to, to, to feel solid again, right? But I don't want to ever go back to the old fashioned way of, of, dis- of discipline. <laughs> okay, um, and so so when you say it's demanding, you're saying it in this way. It's the it's like it's the discipline. It's the of course. it's those those qualities that plug a person into something beyond themselves. Yeah. Demanding is that this is something that is worth hard work. Right? And there's a simple, you know, chazak le tamul sreikam, right? That, uh, how, do you, how do you understand that? You know, is it because it's like a, a guarantee, a haftacha from the Abishur, that if you work hard, you'll, you, you'll get something out of it? Yeah, but what if you're working hard and just you know, taking sand and taking from one place to another. I think I think the vart is that real tamula is is eventually it only lasts when it's for 
something that deserves tamula, right? Effort, effort eventually latches on to something that demands effort and deserves effort. And when you find that, you you will you will be rewarded. Interesting. Right, you'll be rewarded. Something that's that's worth effort. Something that actually takes effort, and if you and you give it effort, or even simpler, something that demands effort, is is what you will give effort to. So if you give effort to well, it, well, I, I I I thought you were saying, and maybe this is also another another meaning that that if a person if a person you know exerts effort. That will eventually, it'll eventually latch onto something that's worthwhile exerting effort. It has to, right? It has to, right? And so, and so, by definition, it won't, it won't be empty-handed because that's what you're going to come up with. Like Chazakla Tamul Shenech If you work hard, what's what are you? What's 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 the not reikum? What's the, f- the, the 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 what you receive is the is the um, is that you don't have to work anymore. Or is the chaz- like is the chazak of Tamil that that one day you'll basically be bought out as they say and you'll make an exit and now you can go uh, drink mimosas on the beach quote unquote not that I find that enjoyable <laughs> I'm just saying right or is the chazak of Tamil that that if you put in the hard work you will find something that deserves Tamil you won't you won't you know, you know right. Right, and then the tamul becomes more fulfilling and more joyful and more purposeful. Saying adam right. you know, right. Right. and anyway, so I'm not I'm not trying to impart a whole philosophy about this. I don't really have one. I'm just I'm saying when I say the word demanding. Why do you say that? It sounds like you do have a philosophy and you want to impart it. Um. Okay, man. I'm saying I. I, I like it. Thank you. I, what I what I mean is what I mean is what I mean is that I like I, I don't I guess by philosophy I mean an agenda like I don't have like what what I'm telling you today I didn't necessarily think about yesterday I, you know what I'm saying oh uh, but but this is a theme for you this thing about this I, I've heard it from this conversation come up in other podcasts uh-huh. you're a stand for the value of hard work you're a stand that chassidus is hard work. Um, yeah. These are things that are, the, you know, you you value hard work, you yeah. abhor cheap thrills and <laughs> you know, know. easy I mean, passes. I mean, this is it's come up before. I mean, uh, I mean, you uh, work hard lifting those weights. Yeah, fair, <laughs> fair. Yeah, I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit of like an extremist in that way. But that's a per- gift. personally. But, but I, if you're asking, that's a gift. Like I think the world. The world needs to hear that that message and that voice, and some people. I'm not embarrassed. May hear it through. Great. I'm not embarrassed. I'm, good, I'm talking. I'm good, talking about good, that. Good. Yeah. No. I'm just, yeah. I guess. I guess you're right. I mean, I. I'm, you're I'm, inclined to talk about it now. I get that, but but it lives in you. Yeah. yeah look, I mean, look. Um, yeshiva, yeshiva was yeshiva was like for me was uh, a taste of what chassidus with hard work looks like. Mm. Um, in many ways, that burnt me. That burnt me, and I, you know, I think that you know that I think we'll have plenty to discuss on that too. Um, you know, I kind of like I saw. I don't know in my own head, or I don't know if I saw an example. Yeah, like, like. When you when you read what Chassidus says, when you learn what Chassidus says, and you read the history of Chassidus, like we were talking earlier, like if 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 we're talking about a god, right, and then we're talking about a Vedas Atfila, and then the idea is to be misspinning in the god of Saber, there's no freak shortcuts. Like what 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 are you right. what are you talking about? Like like oh if I if I if I do it in five minutes because I'm a uh, millennial, then somehow it's gonna work, you know like. They, they, right, but but uh, there's something I'm sensitive to here in what you're saying, which is both the way in which you said you were burned and also the way what you're describing right now, which is I, I in my experience, and this is just my own personal experience. It may not be something collective at all. Right. These things were never communicated and taught to us um, in ways that were expansive, in ways that inspired our imagination, like. 
we, we, we never, I was never communicated like about this. Let's, let's go back for a second, okay? Again, we're going to come back to the world. The world today is halishing for some kind of transcendence, some kind of out of body experience. Um, he, uh, some of it sometimes it's called healing, right? Um, spirituality, like, and really, it's like there's been this tradition for as long as we know, certainly within Chassidus and really within Yiddishkeit for for all the for for millennia, and and there are rituals and there are disciplines and there are practices, right, for really being misdabic in the Ebeshter and, and 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 pulling out of the world and duality and the temporal reality that we're embedded in and the survival instinct and knowing making contact within, right, with that which creates it all. And really, it's like, it, could, it couldn't be, it's like what everyone's looking for, really, like there couldn't be a, a better way to live. In my experience, that whole context wasn't necessarily communicated to me. So it, it, take, it just took on a quality of like a religious duty, a must should have to, some God up in heaven, and, and, and another, another chore, another burden. As I've become older and went on my own journeys and seeking and looking, and particularly to rediscover my own tradition, right, Chassidus and Lubavitch, to rediscover it anew, to see how is this really beautiful, because that's what I'm after. Right. I, I'm after discovering everything that I was raised to believe in and taught. Torah, Mitzvah, Yiddishkeit, Rebbe, Chassidus, the gamut. I'm not looking for something else. I'm looking for it, but in a way that 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 inspires and expands and and ignites the the heart, the mind, the imagination. Not something that's um, romantic, like without hard work, right. but but something that comes along with 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 the with the promise, right? Uh, something that that solve like something that's wholesome. So then I've discovered like oh like this is a whole different different thing. Really, these these things, at least in my experience, maybe a seventeen year old and an eighteen year old, raised cloistered up in 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 in, in our community, right, right, is not even exposed to the reality of being a human being in the world enough to then have the oh, this is the problem that this is designed to actually answer. Maybe that, and or maybe it's the way it's communicated. Maybe it's become tropes, and maybe it's just become must-shoulds and have-tos, and maybe it's just become, you want to be a card-carrying member, you got to do this, 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 this. I understand, this, this, what, I understand what you're saying. That, that wasn't my experience, though. That wasn't my experience at all. That's so, what, but that's the, what I'm saying. So I'm just picking up on the way you said it. It just sounded like that to me. So I'm curious, what what that, was the burn? That wasn't my experience at all, if I cared. If I cared, my experience was that I, I did not feel uh, just obligated to do things I, I, I wanted and I felt that there was something like you're talking about, like there was a deep answer here. Okay. okay. I, like I, I wanted to do it not the right way to check off the boxes, like the right way that I didn't have, that I didn't have to check off boxes. Like that's not what I was doing it for. You know what I mean? Like I, I we, like when you, when you, when you look at the philosophy for what it is without kind of any dilution, right? Like yeah, I mean, there's an Abishter and the same. Uh, there's an Abishter. We learn a lot about this Abishter. We have to think about it a lot. Um, and the same way that Chassidim of old spent a half hour or an hour or however long before davening being misbeinen, me with my crazed, distracted, modern head, you know, whatever other maladies I may have, I have to do that too. And I did. But what's what's the context though for for that? Um, why, why, why would I do it? Because, because it's true. Not because I have to. I, 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 my parents did not push it on me. My shivas didn't push it on me. Um, but what problem does the it's true actually resolve? Well, 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 I, just want okay, to add, I, mean, I just want to add some meat to that bone for a second. Because, right. because the it's true, there's a very strong it's true streak especially in our community, a very tr strong truth streak, which a little bit feels to me a little bit on the conceptual side of things, a little bit on the philosophical side of things. But we both know, Bensi, that being a human being in this world <laughs> is, is, is not at all limited 
to the domain of conceptuality and philosophy. It's not a conceptual problem. No. So, right. So if you say, it's true, it's true. I'm like, okay, I hear that. And that's meaningful in the very, what I consider very constricted, although important and valuable domain of conceptuality. But if someone doesn't have like, what about the rest of your humanity? And like you say, even the way you say, there's an Abishter, you say it with such a ferocious, I love that, by the way. That's like, that's like, there's an Abishter. And and I'm like, okay, okay. But there's a human being here sitting in front of me. I said what I used to say. I said, I said this is what I used to okay, say. Okay, but I'm picking at it for fun okay. because I think there's something here. Like, I think that's significant. Like, yeah. there's an Amish there, and it's like, whoa, 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 it's beautiful, it's true. And I need any race to the but something that often gets over, overlooked or, 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 or overstepped is that is that we're human beings engaging in this conversation, that right. there's an Abish there, and we're bringing him into the world. So there's a subjectivity that almost like precedes the, I see what the you're objectivity. Saying. I see what you're saying. Yeah, okay. But but let, 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 let me flip that a little bit. Okay. For all your sophistication of right now and my sophistication of right now, you know, looking back at the dumb 20-year-old or 15-year-old version of myself, which you know, I love to rag on that guy in many ways. Like, I, okay. it, it's it's fun. <laughs> like, I, I, you thought you knew stuff. Like, uh, what the hell did you know, right? And it, you know, it's like it's kind of fun to like laugh at like that naivete. It's because it's kind of hilarious, okay. right? Not a, not like, not in a malicious way. Not like to like you know, like not not with like that that guy. Not like with hate. More just like it's funny. It's really damn funny. Like uh, this guy was prancing around telling 65 year olds the meaning of life. Like, boy, chick, you don't know nothing. And, like, like lecturing people about like, I learned in this and this place, like this is the answer to your, I remember literally some guy that I knew, um, you know, he had a devastating personal problem in his marriage. And like, he told me about it and I, I don't even know if I was married yet. And I'm giving him, Titus, <laughs> what did I know? I didn't know. So it's funny. So, but as much as we're laughing back at then, or saying like, okay, though, that that version of us didn't know what problem we were even trying to solve. We're gonna say the same thing in ten years about now, God willing. I mean, that'd be if we don't. That's a, that's that, that's a problem. Like, hopefully, in ten years from now, we'll be that much more grown and understanding that we'll look back at now and we'll also laugh, and you know. And I'm taking the the really almost like reckless risk of putting on all my 36-year-old thoughts on record on the internet for perpetuity (laughs) so the entire world can laugh at it, right? Uh, You know, but I'm saying, so the reason I bring that up is because I understand what you're saying about the fact that the 15 year old or 20 year old doesn't really know what problem he's trying to solve but that's not a 15 year old problem a 20 year old problem that's a life problem it's well, a lifelong problem yes and no you always you always you always feel like the earlier version of you didn't know what he was talking about so it's a problem that the 15 year old or 20 year old doesn't know what the problem is well i'm just trying to say to me yeah it seems that <clears throat> excuse me Without getting into whether or not it's always true, and to what extent is it always true? Is it always true to the same extent that it was true? You know, and you know, I think right. there are different levels of leaps as we grow, right? But leaving that out, you said you got burned, and I'm just saying, I, don't, I just, I think it's from, I think it's, it's from my perspective. This, this is a reality that can account for being burned, certainly for me. Yeah. Okay. No, no. I, I'm not disagreeing. That's that, all I'm saying. I'm not disagreeing, but that just that wasn't that wasn't my experience. But I think what I am what what I am, what I am picking up from you, which is, I think, is where where I think we would find common ground, is that, to me, it's not so much about the 15 year old being naive or the 20 year old being naive. I think that's, for the most part, guaranteed and. You know, you're always, you're almost promised that when you get older and you get into quote unquote real life with a family and, 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 and need to provide for the family and need to get along with people with, with, with serious consequences if you don't, right? Your wife, your, your business, it's not, it's no longer, it's no long. you, you don't, you don't get rain checks anymore the way you do when you're younger, right? You're always going to look back at that innocence in a, in a different way, I, I don't think that the problem is innocence. I think the problem is that we we don't know 
or we don't spend enough time figuring out how to go from that place of innocence to a place of non-innocence. We basically say we're going to kind of sit on the innocence. We're going to invest, put all our chips on the table for the, you know, we're going to, we're going to give it the strongest whack we can give and then let everything just happen the way it does. Like we got one chance with this boy. We're going to knock him out in yeshiva. Give, you know, we're going to give him a zets, zets on the cup and then hopefully, hopefully he'll be concussed enough <laughs> that it'll last. But it's it, you know, and, and I think that's a well, problem. That's a problem that I see. But I, but I think this is universal, and I think that could be. And I think that it's kind of the design, right? You get put into the crucible, and then you you get put into the kiln, and then you get spit out, and now it's your turn to figure it out on your own. I don't th- see. <laughs> I I don't think that it has to be that way. I mean, maybe you know, thinking about the story of Gan Eden, where you know Adam and Chava were in this Aden and then they got thrown out. So maybe that's how it is for everybody that they have their Aden and they get thrown out. Um, you know, uh, you know, and, and and I want to go even further. I want to argue the case of the opposite. The what? That's 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 where the the full richness of of things begin to emerge. Whatever you rediscover, whatever you reclaim, whatever you repurpose, um, on the path of of grappling and struggling and saying, "What? Well, what? This doesn't this doesn't add up at all, or it's not working for me, or or you know, this is not meeting my needs." Whatever it is. Whatever you you could then like, come back around to in a, in a more meaningful way or rediscover. That's the real pride. That's what. That's the real. That's where it's really going on. I want to get back to that, but I I do feel I do feel in some way that <coughs> till then it's chinuch. I I yes, but I think chinuch is supposed to be, in a way that gam gam kiask and like you 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 teach someone in a way, like. Chaneich l'nara pidarke is is what chaneich l'nara pidarke is you educate a child according to his path. Now, what's a pshat according to his path? The way I always the way I always you know, the basic understanding that I that I picked up was a child has a certain aptitude for X Y Z. Meaning, you look at the child's past, you see you see where the child is coming from, and you educate according to that, which would be a good start. I think that I think in many cases, in many cases, you know, the kind of the going back to the question of uh, you know mass production versus the craftsman. You know, education today has become a lot more mass produced, and it's if if you're lucky enough to go to a school where they take your past into account, that's already a good step. But I think the real shot is pidarka is you educate a child according to where they're going, not to where they're coming from. You educate a child according to where they're going, right? Where where are they going? To, like education is a forward thinking enterprise. It's not a it's not a past preserving enterprise. I mean, of course, you have no future if you forget about the past. But the reason you educate is because you understand that time moves in one direction, and if you want your past to survive into the future, that's where education comes into play, right? So it's it's a forward thinking enterprise, and so. Who, who, like, is it enough to think about the child where he came from? I would say that no. You have to, where's the child going? Where's this generation going? Right? Why do I bring that up? Because, you know, a lot of times people be like, this is how it goes. This is how it works. This is just how it is. It's, a, it's by design. I think you just said that. It's by design. Like, Yeshiva is basically, it's, it's intense and kind of, you know, over the top. Then it breaks. And then you have to rediscover the pieces. That's a break for everyone, by the way. No, but you said it's kind of by design. You throw, you throw into. I think so. I think even the best educator in the world uh, can't forecast and prevent, and I don't think they should, because I think that that really strips the emergence of individuality in in, in its most purest form. I'm not suggesting. I don't, think, I don't think they can mitigate that. I'm not suggesting prevention. I'm not suggesting to make life inevitable. Um, but I I I I think. You know, there's one thing to kind of try to, you know, baby, uh, to wrap life up in, you know, in enough bubble wrap that nothing goes wrong and that's a problem. But there's also this other problem, which is this kind of fatalism that, like, 
yeah, yeah, it's just gonna break. So let's just let's just give it a whack and see what happens, and then hopefully enough guys will pick up the pieces after. And I don't I don't think that's by design. You know, yes, I understand Gan Eden, they were thrown out, but I don't think that's a that's a example that we tried to emulate. But Benz, it used to be not everyone went to Yeshiva, right? Right. We're now in an age where everyone goes to Yeshiva. Right. Yeshiva is a, Yeshiva has become a Right. Talk about the religious consumerism. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. No, so you sure. have become you have become mass business. How like uh, how how do you how do you how is it in any way like realistic to to envision a quality of education so profound when 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 you have mass yeshiva systems and 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 le'idoch. If you would admit that it's that it's it's more of a, a desire or a wish than a, than a reality, right. would you are you suggesting that that guys would be better off not going to Yeshiva? I'm Here, curious. Here's an idea. Here's an idea. I, I wouldn't say you're wrong. I'm just curious to hear your whole philosophy on it. Uh, I don't have a philosophy for this. I mean, I do. Uh, you're call me out on it. <laughs> Every time you say, I don't have a philosophy on it, I know you do. Because if you didn't, you wouldn't have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair. Fair. Here's my idea. My, I'm, I'm not going to talk about whole philosophy. My, my simple idea is you have, every, Mashpim should go work for two, three years before they go into Yeshiva. Out, they should work outside Yeshiva mm. before they go into Yeshiva. Now I know that I know that sounds clever and uh, funny. I'll explain myself. You know, a few years ago, uh, I was in Pomona for Shabbos, and I bumped into after davening um, a fellow who was my mashpia back in the day in Muncie when I was in Shiv in Muncie, um, and you know I just got to talking. I hadn't seen him in years. You know, I, I, I had quite a bit of respect for him then and in retrospect in, in many ways even more. Uh, he, he, you know, he took his job very seriously. He took Yiddish guy very se- seriously. He came on time to say that. Like, he was very, in what he believed, like, he, you know, he, he was very into Kabbalah soil and, 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 like, and discipline. And he was an extremely disciplined person. Came on time, as sure, and were prepared. Fabringans were not, were not, have, like, like, time was never, inval- like, time was always valuable and very measured. Um, yeah, so so I met him in shul. I said hello and how you doing. It turns out he's not in shiv anymore. I, I don't know what the parsh is. I don't know. Uh, he was in business. He's gone. He went into business. So I didn't ask him why or exactly what. Whatever, fine. I asked him if you could go back in time to when you were a What would you tell him, given what you know now? You know what he told me? He said, if I went back in time, I would tell my Mashpia version, you cannot demand anything of the Bachrim. You don't know what they're going through. Like, how could you make how could you make demands? Like he's like, I'm in business now, I see what life is. I'm demanding things from these boys. Well, what am I what am I even talking about? It's hard enough for me. And it was it was a very serious conversation. It wasn't like a joke or like ha ha funny. Like you know, like look how look how real we are now compared to back back then. How naive we were. That wasn't the point. It was dead serious. And to me, that's a very kind of powerful um, observation of the disconnect between yeshivas and the life that comes after. Mm. See what I'm saying? And that's where I say that there's a fatalism where we basically have kind of accepted as a as just a as a as just a way a fact of life that yeshiva is yeshiva and there's a truth of yeshiva, but that truth of yeshiva kind of is bound to yeshiva, and then what happens happens. That's so fatalistic, and it goes against the very essence of chassidus. Uh, but I think that the Rebbe does talk about, for example, a Seil Harab. If someone makes himself a Seil Harab, that will help them take Yeshiva and, and, and reach it. And I, I understand. There, but there, there, there's a way. And for a lot of people, it's a seamless transition. But the Yeshiva, the Yeshiva, but okay, we, we, we admit, we accept, most people accept, I think, 
that 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 there's this kind of you go up, you fall, and you kind of you 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 you. I actually yourself. like your idea. Yeah. So, I, question is, is if we would have any more speed. Uh, I, I, you know, I I think we would. Yeah. After but, three years in the real world. Look, you see, <laughs> so in a sense, you are totally right that this is actually a philosophy because it's you know by definition, philosophy is not really connected to practical. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's, it's more it's more I feel like it's a thought experiment that that just kind of illustrates the point that I'm trying to make which is I, I think that you know I think that yeshivas need to have a vocabulary and just a mindset of like you know this is a place where we're educating people for the future mm. this is not a place we're trying to hold we're not yeshiva is not a place that holds on to the past I'm sorry that's not what the definition of yeshiva is now of course Tradition means that you educate for a future that's connected to the past. But the goal of the yeshiva is not to hold on to the past. We are not against time. You want to ask me what my philosophy is. I didn't come here for this podcast to talk about my philosophy. But uh, we're here. We're why, here. Did, why did we come? We're, we're going to get to it in a second. We're here. Um, By the way, what about a podcast or your philosophy? Where, where, why isn't that happening? I don't know. Because oh. no, nobody asked me on it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't. Okay. I don't invite myself on things. Like I don't invite myself on my own podcast. You understand? No, but I'm saying if you ask me about my philosophy, we cannot be against time. We cannot be against time. It, it, it's preposterous. It's preposterous to be against time. Right. As so long as we are creations in this world, we are bound by time. Now, Torah is the Milam in Azman. Right? We are able to connect to things that are higher than time. But first of all, that's timeless. That's not something that goes backwards in time. It's eternal. Right. It's not like you can't ever reverse time. You can, you can transcend time. You can connect to something that's timeless. You can understand that time is not everything. But time is time. Time is something. Right, and so this kind of education or mindset of holding on to the past or scared of the future. Where did that come from? Scared of what's going to happen. But I also it's, it's but, all going to fall you're apart. You're also creating it. You're also you're contextualizing things in a certain way. I'm sure many of the listeners of this podcast will be like, "What's he talking about? Who's scared of the future? They had good must be. They're, they're used good, to it. They're, they're used to it. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to acknowledge that because. I think that, look, I think that language actually creates, right? The way we contextualize something adds mass to it. Right. I'm sensitive to what you're saying. I think there's truth to it. But I also just want to acknowledge that the, the more it's languaged, the more it's articulated, then the more distinct it becomes, you know? And the more of a, the more of a life, of more of a, an autonomy or a life of it own, its own, it assumes. And then it could almost be like, not so much in context. I think I say amen. It should be. It should be. I think it should be spoken about, and I think it should be confronted head on. Because, in my opinion, that is the most debilitating thing going on today. Mm. The most debilitating thing going on today is this idea that we can be against time, uh, because that is, to me, the 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 kind of first step, the the ground zero of a lot of the pervasive cynicism that we experience. You know, when, when, when we think that we can be against the one thing that, you know, the, the one fact that no one escapes, we can be against that. We, we don't, you know, death doesn't apply to us fully. Um, time doesn't apply to us fully. I think well, Lubavitch overall has been really evolving in that regard. I, fair, fair. I, I, you know, I, I, I would be happy to find out that, I, that my views are 10 years behind and that the problems that I'm diagnosing are so 2010. You'd be happy to find that out. 2010? Oh, yeah, my, the problems that I'm diagnosing, are, they're so 2010, bro. Like, we're so past that. I would love to hear that. I am ready to put money down that it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, N now that we're an hour deep into this, uh, whoever's been putting up with my ramblings, um, no, we did come here for a reason. You asked, why Why are we here? We we And I, I, def I, de I definitely want to get to it Um before before you know before the conversation's out i think and i think what we did the past hour 
really set the ground for it. Has to. Uh, yeah. You know, we were speaking By the way, of... Do I, we need to wear these? Is it bothering you? It hurts my ear a little bit. Do you want, oh, maybe I can lower no, it. No, physically it's hurting my ear. No, it helps you lock in, but if you don't, if, it, if it's bother, if it's if it's bothering you, it's being counterproductive. Oh, right. Right. just talk like this. Yeah, it, it helps me lock in. Oh, but if, okay, it, good. if it's bothering you, then then you're then it's not locking you in. It's bothering you. Yeah. So, what was I going to say? You know, we were discussing on the phone um, when we were originally talking about this idea about Chitas and Rambam. So why why don't you talk a little bit about that? Give the, give a, give a little bit of the background for that. I think. I think you know uh, my ramblings, are not you know notwithstanding. Uh, I think I think we, we we laid the ground for that conversation in the past. Uh, you know, so why don't you talk a little bit about what that was about? Um, yeah, today is the I think one thousand and sixty fourth consecutive day. You think or you know? You know. Uh, well, I don't know if it's like 63, 64, 65. I have to check. Uh huh. Okay. Um, that I've learned chitas before shkia, that I've learned chitas without missing before shkia. Um. So, what we were talking about on 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 when we were on the phone, and it's a little bit of a painful conversation to have, but I think a necessary one. Because I I know because people reach out to me individually. Right and appreciate when I talk about this and and have have expressed gratitude for, for me being a voice for this, um, is that w- one of the very significant aspects of this for me? There's a bunch of things that are very significant to me about this, but one of them is that over my life I really never wanted to do chitas and never did it much at all. Um, just because of the way in which I experienced it being demanded of me. Just right. because the way in which um, it felt to me, together with a whole bunch of other, uh, you know, Hasidic stuff, or that it was like some kind of like rite of passage, or that that somehow made me a good Hasid, right. uh, valuable, worthy. Um, I mean, made in the like the amount of guilt I would feel before going to the oil for years and right. years and years because I wasn't doing kitas and rambam and I'm doing all the things and being a good boy right and 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 then like the feeling of like a need to like to cleanse myself before going to the oil right so like going to the oil was in its own right now is terribly traumatic and intense experience and for a long time I was like I, I believe that that's good yeah. that's the right thing and that's 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 you're, a, f- you're feeling something yeah and 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 but but well eventually like Eventually, it just it became untenable, and I and I and I, I, you know, there was a long time, long time where actually I would go to the oil and just say to the rabbi, "I don't know who you are, hmm. and I don't know what you want, but I know I should be here." Like I couldn't, like uh, my my relationship with 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 the rabbi, you know, uh, was was shaped uh, to a significant extent by the way in which his takanas. And minhagim and and chesedish zach and whatever all these things were were communicated to me, I guess, or the way I experienced them, the way I imbi- imbibed them, which was um, less than wholesome to say the least, right? Like like to be nice. No kidding. And so at a certain point, it was like I didn't want to I didn't want to disconnect from the Rebbe because somewhere in me knew that the Rebbe must not be that that trauma. Right. I How knew, did you know that? Because it's already a few times that you're saying that you always knew you were going to come back. Like, it's an interesting question. People ask me this all the time. I just, I just, uh, you know what? I don't know if I knew that or I decided it. Right. Or I just, I decided that that you know, there's just, there's just no way. But you know, I look. I, I don't. I'm not an idiot. I mean, the Rebbe's a holy man. You know, like uh, you don't have to be such a genius to just stop for a minute and realize, okay. This is a holy man, a godly man. Um, you know, uh, I mean, it's the same is true with Terry Mitzvah and Yiddishkeit. Like, the person has to ask the question, like, do I believe that God Almighty um, and authoritarianism and abuse and control, like, do I believe, like, those 
go together. Like it's it's right. really you know I couldn't. It right. was it, it violated my sensibilities to believe that that they were synonymous. But I couldn't experientially and even like in terms of my conditioning, I couldn't pull them apart. I had no other point of reference. Mm. And these experiences and conditioning was very deeply entrenched. Mm. So for a while, I would just go and say, here I am. Uh, you know, I, I, I want to be here. I know I should be here. It's a good place, but I don't know anything else. You know, even a pond I couldn't write. Like the, the whole pond, the whole ritual was just associated with so much shame and guilt and intensity and, and, um, and it was just like, listen, if the rabbi could read my pond, then he could hear my words, you know, like right. I had to go in a, in a place of slave of Kalaman, you know, just. Uh, so, so coming back to Chitas, um, and this has been something difficult to talk about, and it's not like, it's not like it has to be talked about endlessly, and a lot of people don't have this experience at all, and, and the rabbi is, 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 is. Not, not the second best thing to slice bread. The Rebbe is sliced bread. But for, for some people, um, this is a very difficult challenge and it's hard to talk about because people take such offense right. if they hear anyone saying anything less than wholesome in association with the Rebbe. And to be clear, I'm not saying that this is the Rebbe has done this. Of course not. Where did that come from? Because you, you, have, this, you have this phenomenon where... People will dismiss God categorically okay. and easily. Like, how could God let this boy suffer? I kind of like, bum, done. That question kind of just destroys God. But like, there. But the Rebbe can't touch. Where do you think that comes from? I think that, I mean, it's a very interesting question. I think that, look, uh, fundamentally, right, that's not a coherent, there's no coherence to that. Right. Because, because if you believe in the Rebbe, you believe in God. Right. Not because the Rebbe is God, but because the Rebbe stands for right. all things divinity. Right. All things God as it comes through Right, without God, he's not a holy man, sure. by definition. Yeah, right. Right, exactly. There's without no, that God no that you're angry at, or, or whatever, or some God. <laughs> without some God out there who's, you know, who, who, who's... Not who's, some God, without, without the Abishur, without, like, the without Jewish... the Jewish God who's right. expressed himself and who can be made contact with through Torah, Moshe, and Kiyom HaMitzvah in the linear dualistic world, there's no rabbit. Right. Um, so, so therefore really it's not coherent, but I think, I think what actually is occurring is it's a hack. Mm. It's, it's a way into God for people. What does that mean? That means the Rebbe, first of all, was incarnated in a human body and a human being, right? Which, which, which allows people to associate with him as a person. Um, he was a person, right? I'm saying, but it allows for that connection, which is not allowed for with a deity. Mm. Um, in the same way and there's relationship mm. and it occurs within the context the human context mm. so so it's it's a way in which people can link in in truth to, to divinity and godliness and everything that that Yiddishkeit really believes in um, it's a way that they can link into it it's a way in mm. It's a way in that they could still be connected with that with that tradition and with their neshama. Now, to be in all honesty, that's, that's a very, very, very like ridiculous kind of take on that. Well, I always like to think of things from a perspective of like from a contextual perspective. In other words, the person himself might say, "No, heck, no, no." But if you just but if you if you just zoom out for a second and you think about what's happening at a more meta level, you're like, what? Well, like the Ibish there, there is no rebel without the Ibish. But even so, there, so, so how do you you know? You're not even saying something coherent. Even there, Elamai. At the end of the day, people don't want to, in truth, disassociate or forfeit their identification with their own neshama, with the divinity, with, with with God itself. But their ideas of God, their ideas of God are very asinine, are very distorted. Um, so they have to throw them away. 
It's a, it's, it's, it's a much, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a cumbersome philosophical, theological, spiritual, and emotional journey to then find God. No, but I think but the Rebbe is an access point. Right now, they don't say it that way, but I think that's what's occurring. But I think, I think you're, I think, I think, the. I, I still think from a meta level, you're looking at it from a very particular place, and that doesn't make it untrue. I think though that I think though that if we're going to be brutally honest, which I appreciate you talking about this topic, and I remember the way you phrased it on the phone. I hope you don't mind that I repeat it. You said it wasn't that I didn't do chitas. I like def- like I absolutely I rejected I re- it. Like I definitely did not do it. Like Rish Lakish with the Torah. Like I absolutely <laughs> like I was against chitas, right? And you know, like I think you know that's a very honest kind of. That's a very honest statement, and not that. But I should point out, not philosophically. I, I never had a philosophical I, I, I claim I about anything. No. Just from a psychological place, from I an understand. emotional place, it was like, I, yeah, I re- yeah, I, I can't do it. And I and I and I want to add the caveat: I don't believe in honesty for the sake of honesty. Like just because, like if you say something, if you say something to someone that's hurtful, you can't say, "Oh, I'm just being honest." Right. You know, honesty is not a cover for being a schmuck or being an being an idiot, right? But I, I I appreciate the honesty in the sense because I don't think you're you're I don't think you're I, I don't think you're saying it just so you just to be honest I think I think you have you, there's a point that you're trying to convey but a lot of people don't convey it because they're scared so it's more I appreciate the, the courage to say it more than quote unquote the honesty um, and by I, the way I just want to be clear like I, I don't know what's going to happen through me sharing this publicly right right. Um, Who's gonna re- react to it negatively? Who's gonna reject it? Who's gonna say, "Oh, Fitz, you know, I'm not gonna wear his tefillin anymore." Uh, who knows what? I have no idea. But what I will say is, what matters most to me is if one person hears this, right? And they and they say, you know, he's really he's really saying something. I've 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 wanted that. I you know I want to heal my relationship with Hashem. I want to heal my relationship with the Rebbe. I would like to heal my relationship with the Shabbos guys. I can relate to this guy. If I can, if I can, through sharing this, bring even one person, one step closer, right, to to the Rebbe, to the Ebeshet, to his neshama, which by now in my life means to to is the same as to who they really are, right, like their true self. Then, then I will have fulfilled my purpose. I, you know, I think all the time, like I don't need to. That's my. That's that's what I'm interested in. That's what I'm concerned about. Uh, let me die knowing that someone, someone was able to re-engage with chitas or anything else of the Rebbe, and and enjoy that and grow through that through this being shared. Like that's really that that that's it's not a mic drop. It's not like. You know, because it's like it's become almost popular to be like honest nowadays. You know, that's what I'm saying. I, honesty per se is not. It's not honesty for the sake of honesty is not what's speaking to me here. It's and I was sh- ashamed of this for a long, long, long time. As a matter of fact, when I started doing chitas every day, doing I don't like that expression. Learning it, um, I didn't share it until I was forty days in. It's just a saying. We say chitas. I, say <laughs> I learned it. I I didn't share it publicly until uh-huh. I was forty days in. I was uh-huh. too humiliated. Like forty days was like right. enough really, of an achievement. Like who? Who do you think you are? That like forty? I've been doing it for forty years. No, I was too humiliated to expose that I hadn't been doing. Right, it. That's what I'm saying. If I would say, "Oh, today's the first day I'm doing chita." No, but if I said I did chitas for forty days in a row, uh-huh. uh, there would be something else to kind of like something notable over here uh-huh. to notice, other than and before that, like. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. It's, it's not I, I, I want to get to how why you changed, but I, I first feel like you know if, if this is already the podcast where I where where I air all my grievances, um, you know. <laughs> 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 I, talk, I, I, I I I I don't I, I say that's a joke. I hope it's not grievances, but you know, I I I feel like I before we get to what turned for you. I, I feel like I want to push back on this idea that yes, I hear what you're saying, that people are are looking to hold on to their relationship with 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 God, um, with truth, yeah, with and life. They're angry at this, so they feel for whatever reason that the way they can hold on, the way they kind of position themselves is, 
if so long as I hold on to the Rebbe, even if I am angry at God, I'm somehow without accepting that I'm still holding on to God. I'm holding on to God. Something is something to. That I don't effect. think they think that consciously. No, no, I understand, but, but that, yeah. that's what's going on. I'm not look. It's possible. It's possible. I think it's a very favorable way of looking at it, and that doesn't disqualify it. But I, I think it would be wrong to ignore a. I don't know if it's a simpler explanation, but okay. to me, a more obvious explanation because it goes to what you were saying before that which is how did the Rebbe end up this way in our minds because what you're describing I, I agree with you that not everyone listening to this or every Lubavitcher or the majority I don't have I don't have numbers I didn't pull this I understand that not everyone feels this way but the idea that this is some kind of rare condition that people feel this kind of cumbersome trending towards negativity towards complete exhaustion with chitas and all these takanas that it's rare it's, it's, it's totally not true it's totally there's a difference between exhaustion and tiredness no, and, I'm about, and trauma I'm talking about and, spiritual exhaustion not just tired like well, you, you go I remember being a bachar in yeshiva seeing a lot of very chitas bachar and whatever like like remembering to learn chitas and rambam at night which indicates the level of priority and enthusiasm right. they had for it in the first right. place I don't care like your actions tell you something about what you care like why are you waiting you, you didn't wait the right. whole day to eat breakfast. Right. Or to do anything. Right. And you waited all the way till your eyes are drooping and then we say Rambam. Like, right. come on, we, we, we know what's what, what's what. Like, let's stop being silly about it. Did everybody feel that way? No. But a lot of guys did. It was not rare. Okay. And, and, and so how did that happen? How did we get there? How did we get to a place where what you, you know, the Rebbe who's a tzaddik and also parenthetically a brilliant man right how did we get to a place where his takanas became caricatures mm. how, how did how did the man who loved to learn a Rambam in the greatest aimic possible how did we get from a takana that came from that man about learning Rambam turn into something called saying Rambam and Which, I want to point out that what you're, the issue that you're raising now, it's good. We can talk about it. It's a little different than my issue that I had with it. No, I, but I don't think it is. I mean, I'll, I'll get okay. to it. I, I don't I'm think it is. Well, how did we get there? And what I was, how did we get there? Because, like you said, if a, like, if you think of it as the Rebbe is a individual with certain perspective, with certain ideas, and a certain worldview, how did we get from that that person, that worldview, to this? It makes no sense. Make, makes no sense. It doesn't map out. So how do you explain it? How do you account for it? And what I would what I would suggest is something went wrong along the way. Something broke or something changed in between how it was conceived by the Rebbe to how it became a public practice. And in general, that's how the world works. There's an idea. That idea it could be very private and individual and very... Uh, and, and and I hate the word nuanced because it's it's used in the least nuanced way. Textured. But, no, yeah, but it it just has that kind of that that complication of of, of a person where where it's 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 so connected to the person's uh, the person's own shape that it that it, it it's it's very intimate to him, right? And as that idea becomes popularized, it loses that in some way. Right, and it becomes a popular thing. It becomes it becomes something of the masses, and at that point, but he taught it to the masses. He wanted it to become something. One second, one second, one second. This is already this is already Lubavitch pushback. I, I I'm happy to accept it. One second, we'll get there. I'm not, I'm not. I'm but not, in that in this case, you don't agree. I'm open. To, I, I I'm open to any pushback. I agree with you that but the way the first Rambam was illuminated for the Rebbe. Let's first diagnose and in his mind and in his heart. It will be different Let, for you. One second. Let's first diagnose what's going on before we before we push back on it. I, I'm I'm totally open for it to be pushed back on. Okay. It's, I think we have to diagnose it for what it is. Okay. Right. Something to me changed over there, and what changed there was that, you know, the, the, the Rebbe had ideas, the Rebbe had visions, and then as they got popularized, those ideas came under tremendous pressure. Oh, can I, can I, I want to add, I want to suggest something here uh -huh. that I think. Have you ever heard the Rambam song that I wrote in Detroit? No. Do you know about, oh, okay, so th this I think might be, might actually be connected with what you're saying. I want to say this. So when I was in, in Detroit camp, there was a Seymour Rambam. 
Uh -huh. And I wrote a Rambam song. Okay. It was a very painful experience for me because I wasn't learning Rambam. <laughs> right? But I was being asked to write this song. And like I've shared with you before, I believed in it deep down somewhere. Somewhere I wanted to. All right. I believed it was truth. I don't know. Like All I right. believe that it's a good thing and the right thing. And I, right. somewhere in me, I knew that. All right. But I wasn't doing it. And they asked me to write the song. So a fascinating thing happened. Uh, it's, it's the song is recorded. Anyway, maybe we can link it in the bottom of the video. I'll like. give you the link to it. So I wrote the song and there was this big debate that erupted amongst the staff. What should the song bring out? Should the song bring out the reasons that the Rebbe provided for the Takana. Right. Or, take a guess. What is the feel, the skashos that you, that you get through doing it? Skashos. Right. What's Rambam really about? This was a raging debate. Okay. And the song that I wrote, by the way, had both. Precisely what I'm talking about. Very put, good. Put, I put both in and I, I will link the song. I put both in. The beginning of it is the reasons that the Rebbe gave right. for the, the context that the Rebbe offered for this. Right. And then the last paragraph is it's a scotch, it's connected to the Rebbe, and it doesn't matter, right? The, connected to the Rebbe. There are two different wavelengths, the gamma. It's like Mamali and Soibe, it's like Mishpotim and, 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 and Mishpotim and, and Chukim, the way the Rebbe explains it in Kiyosh There are two different things, but is, am I, is that somehow connected with what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, uh, bullseye, bullseye, bullseye. <laughs> Look, like the Rebbe presents the idea in a context, and that context is meant to illuminate it in a certain way and make it make you have a certain relationship with it. Somehow that gets evaporated and it gets turned into it gets fed into the the Hiskashra's funnel. In a more animated moment, I would tell you that you know the, the first part, the reasons, was what the Rebbe gave, and then the second part is Bob Meisus. It's 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 Feglach and Buzim. It's what people decided. But in a more animated moment, yeah, you would say that. Yeah, because I, I think I think <laughs> no, I think because I think when you're more set, I, I'm trying to be more considerate now. I feel like it's 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 too dismissive to say there's nothing to it. It's very possible that that's you know. Why do you care what the Rebbe says? Like, why would the Rebbe says to do this very hard thing every day? Why do you care? Because he's a smart man? No, because you want to be connected to him. You, like, the reason that you're going to choose this commitment when there are many other commitments to make is, in many ways, because of his gashers, right? So it's, like, it's it's easy to to kind of dismiss it like a bunch of you know silliness, but I, there's definitely yes, I think there's I think there's for sure something there, but I I certainly think that that. Even if they're not two separate or opposite things, they are two distinct things, and they get mixed up as if they're one thing. And then what ends up happening is saying Rambam, which which is just a total act of cynicism. Like it's like historic levels of cynicism. Like we're like the Rambam is a book of understanding. That's the whole point of it. The whole point is to make make Torah understandable and legible, and then we say it. What? what? Like. Like it's like people reading and that's off. That's why the Rebbe chose Rambam because it's the only book that covers precisely all tired mitzvahs. Precisely. So, so, so you see a you, when you see a situation that the people that are doing Rambam presumably for good reasons, I or presumably for a righteous reason of iskashos are doing Rambam upside down because no one's going to convince me that saying Rambam is normal on any level. Saying it. Yeah. Right. Lipping it. Lips. Lipping. No, it. reading. Like, uh, get a friend right. and like say, like, right, what right, is right, that? Right, right, It's a strange right. thing. It's ridiculous. It. It's it's strange on historic levels. Okay, so when 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 how did we get from Iskashas to that? So, like 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 like. I just like, want to say a devil's advocate for one minute. Yeah. If you go from the opposite direction, there's virtue to it. Meaning, if a person looks from the bottom up and they see a kid falling asleep on your you say. Thank God he's got Rambam to fall asleep on that comic. I don't buy that. That, that, that but I, I think there's validity to the, it. The, However, that I don't personally, buy. I think there is value to that point. Yeah, possibly. But what, what you're pointing out, okay, yeah, but how do we get here? No, no, it's worse than that because because it's very it's very nice and, and feels right. It feels right and righteous to point out that, you know, at least he's falling over a Rambam and not over a magazine. It doesn't just feel righteous. There's validity. Uh, yes, yes, perhaps. However, however, we, we often only, like, if you want to go there, if you want to bring that into the equation, then you are also forced to accept what about all the damage that it caused in the sense that what has it told an entire generation or two generations of Bachrim that there's actual value in, in mouthing words off a of paper 
and not bothering to understand them, what does that tell them, not just about Rambam, but learning in general, and about their use of time in general? It, it, it's, 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 it's an act of sheer cynicism that this is somehow a productive use of time. But how are you connecting this with the Rebbe Ebishter? One second, one second, one second. One second. I, we're, we're kind of going, we're kind of, you know... We're, I'm, we're, waiting, we're, I'm waiting for that. We're vibing here. No, okay. I'm saying if you're going to, if you want to point out the upside in it, you have to also accept the downside. And, and it's very unclear to me that that the upside necessarily, uh, like yes, it may be better for this bacher if he wasn't doing Rambam. Who knows what he would be doing? But what about the other bacher who, if not for this kind of futile Rambam, Correct. would be more serious about life in general? Okay, but so, that's harder to. But that's 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 a little bit of. A, I just want to say, in, to be honest, that's a harder case to make. In other words, like this, it's a, it's an easier case to say. Look, we all know how many distractions are in the world. Today, right. we all know what all the options are of what to fall asleep over. Right. Yeah. Someone who comes up, grows up in the system and they're inundated with all these things that for whatever reason, good, bad, or ugly, they're busy falling asleep on Rambam, it's a win. To, to argue that because of that, there's a fallout or damage... Is it tzarchiyon? There may be correlation, but not causation. I, I don't see. I don't. I, I saying, saying to be I, I, strictly. I disagree. If you want to be. I disagree. But I, but, I, but I just want to acknowledge that regardless of that, but I disagree. regardless I, of that, you're asking a fundamental question that has to be addressed. Yes. How did we get here? Now that we're here, you can be malam b'tzchosan in some way. Uh, well, okay, yeah, then, yeah. yeah. Let's but, put it well, aside. How did we get here, and what's actually happening? Let's put it aside. How did we get here? And I, I think, you know, I think it's worth a lot of thought. But I think to me, the, the obvious example that would jump out is that there, there is a massive challenge or problem, like a problem, but not a problem like, so I shouldn't use the word problem because it'll be misunderstood. There's a, there's a almost impossible challenge of taking the Rebbe's ideas and popularizing them without them losing their original intention. Like in general, in life, when something and, and you know mysteriously sometimes conversations just like they they kind of they fall back on on itself even though you never expect it to. The way we started about Safras, it's so perfectly it's such a perfect example, right? You cannot you cannot mass produce Safras. Safras is that kind of that hill that you die on. That some things the Abishur's words must be written by an individual who is individual as you, no less. Not some faceless dude in in China, right? It has to be an individual, right? And you know be, why? Because some things cannot be cannot be popularized to the point that they lose their individuality, right? And yet, when you have a a a, a situation where the Rebbe is no longer a Rebbe of a few chassidim, where everybody knows who he is and they feel this kind of individual connection, and they have the Rebbe told this person to learn this safer. You know, you have these beautiful stories. The Rebbe tells Rebbe to learn this, and he tells someone else to learn that. And this is your Maida uh, Havizari Batve. And and like there's this, and you go on shlichas here, you go on shlichas there. There's very individual kind of connections. But you know, there's a takana that's public and and for the public and mat and and for the masses. It's very hard for that to be accepted and as by the masses and popularized without losing the original intent. And I would argue that that's that to me is precisely the challenge. That's precisely the challenge. But before right, before I get there, because I, I think that's where we're going to come back to I why. I want to say that there was one year where I learned Sefer Amitzis. Uh -huh. Didn't miss a day. I learned Sefer Amitzis in the original Sefer Amitzis. It was a very rich experience for me. Right. But I was ashamed. Right. And I thought to myself, how sad is that? That I'm here, I'm doing something good. Right. I'm. I'm not only it's something better than nothing. Right. But moreover, I'm literally learning every day the mitzvahs. I'm learning the klalim. I learned the klalim. Right. I actually learned the klalim. Right. And it was interesting for me that like, that like yeah you know because the Rebbe once said like uh, uh, um, or, it, or something like bid the one parak. Do you remember right. all those who are learning three prakim? Remeizah shibishatia. The Rebbe said right. they're only learning one parak. You know, and I remember that like being like. Like almost like turned into like a trope in yeshiva, like, you know, are you a bit Aza if and Shatiya kind of chassid, you know, right. like it was like and like it just becomes like more and more like you're just caught up in some kind of so, yeah, it's fun to acknowledge and, and share that for people. Like like if you're not doing it, like yeah, like if you come back to the to what the Rebbe had to say about it and what the Rebbe had to say about everything, like 
uh, 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 something, you know, do something good at the midst of, if you if you take everything that the Rebbe had to say about stuff, it would what might lead you to very well lead you to the conclusion, I'll learn safer on mitzvahs today. Right, you know? right. But if you but if you are caught up not in what in, in the Rebbe's message and the Rebbe's love and the Rebbe's light, but through the translation and through the commercialization and through the you know the, the group think and everything. That could it could take courage to do that. It could oh, yeah. be oh, yeah. hard to do something like that, and you might even keep it a secret. Right. So I just want to be a voice for that. But. Absolutely. No, absolutely. I I, I, I I think I think what you're pointing to here is very important. I think that I think that what I was mentioning earlier about the challenge of taking a inspired idea and culture came called Hemre, holy Rucha Kaidish the idea and for it to become popularized without losing that original inspiration is hard enough that was before or that's even in a situation where the society as a whole is not positioned to shame one another and hold <laughs> turn this holy idea into a bludgeon to, to knock people around them up, down a peg but and I don't think this is necessarily a Lubavitch thing. And certainly we don't have to go into that in this conversation if it's a specific Lubavitch thing. I think it's a society thing, and I think certainly a, is 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 around and prevalent in Lubavitch, where on top of the the inherent challenge of of living up to an inspired idea is this communal pressure, right? That's part of the challenge, or it's an added layer of the challenge where it's not just that I have to hold on to this inspired idea, even though I don't necessarily have that personal relationship that would, like, I have to kind of figure out my place in it personally in the first place. But I, I, I this idea has now been kind of co-opted by the masses and shaped by the masses. And very often the masses are intolerant. They have, they, they kind of, masses work in funny ways, right? And they kind of, coalesce around certain ideas very often in ways that none of them as individuals would ever come around to, but because of just the way masses work. I, I, I want to question that, though. That's, that's an interesting philosophy to, to throw out there, and it sounds sophisticated, but I think it's worthwhile asking the question, and maybe not here, necessarily here and now, but like the question is, when there is something that happens amongst the masses, is, can it really be said that... None of those people individually would have ever come up with that, and there's something about the sum total of the mass that creates that or precipitates that. Absolutely. Okay, I think that's I, worthy I, of looking I, into. I, I, could break, I, I could break it down for you. I oh. could break it down for you. I could break it down for you. There are many things that if you if you were not worried about what the person next to you thought, about what you you believe a certain thing, you would be very open about that belief. But bec but because you're worried about what the other person thinks, you hold in that belief. And you say, okay. You don't think there's shared sentiments amongst groups of people? The problem with the problem with masses is that you can very quickly have like you can very quickly have an idea that is held by a few, but because they're the most adamant that that will quickly become. I, the, hear. I mean, this has been. I hear that as a possibility, but it's not necessarily a necessity. It could, there is a possibility of masses. Who actually sh share a common vision? No, there's no such thing. I, Every time there's it's a, a mass, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. I hear by, you. By, by definition, I hear you. by definition, I hear because you. the masses, the, the the mistake is not that the masses aren't like the the problem doesn't begin that the masses aren't able to live up to it. The problem is that it became a masses thing in the first place. Why is this something that belongs to the masses? Why is my learning the Rambam something that's been filtered through the masses? Going a step further, why is my relationship to the Rebbe something that belongs to the masses? Why the hell do they get a vote? Why? It's not something... It's well, not. They only get a vote if you, if you, if you to the extent that, that you... Allow them to. Allow them to. Right, but, but until you make that break... Yes. And say, I'm going to learn Sefer Mitzvahs. Right. Because that's what works for me and that's how I connect to this. 
So you, I can get until then, you are until then you are held hostage by the masses because the masses have told you. But a lot of people are not held hostage by it. You, well, okay, one second. We're dancing. We're dancing back and forth here. I'm talking about your story. Yes. And they're, yes, they're, yeah, but I can't have a grievance on masses. I'm saying masses it's, it's do a, their thing, it's a, it's and it's a, very good for lots of people. We're not talking about. First of all, first of all, I don't think that's true. But we're not talking about grievances. We're talking about your. We're talking about yes. diagnosis. Yes. We're talking about diagnosis. My here. story. It was very difficult being caught up in the system, in the masses, in the group think. In it was, it was, in the, it was very difficult. Right. And, very and, very difficult. And 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 it's it's not uncommon. So the fact that some people. Either the masses work for them, or they don't work according to the masses. God bless, God bless, God bless. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like this idea that I'm insisting on looking, or uh, that I'm looking for problems with. Oh, okay, you're you're, just, you're distinguishing a phenomenon for certain individuals. Yes. Uh, diagnose, diagnose what it is. If we're going to be honest about it, let's be honest all the way, like or, or, as far as we can go in this conversation, as far as we're capable of going ourselves. You know, of course. I, I am biased in many at ways. At our current age. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And put it on the internet. Right. For us to laugh at in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying, like... like, like. Listen, it may be the only kosher comedy in 10 years on the internet, by the way. What's that? This? Yeah, it's very possible. God knows. So it's a service. Yeah. <laughs> when, you, when you think of it that way. <laughs> Is that a bit that you would take? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm just saying, what, like, what, why... Like, why, why does it belong to the masses? <clears throat> and the reason it belongs to the masses, the reason it belongs to the masses is because the masses, the masses are much bigger than you. But I think the problem is, the problem is that, that, that these things, meaning the problem is not that the masses end up going sideways. The problem is that these things go to the masses in the first place. You know, I, I do want to hear from you more why, like when you decided I mean, you already touched on a little bit when you decided I, I to kind of... I want to share about that, but to, sh- to, sh- but I to still shove want it. to come back to the Abishter Rebbe thing. Oh, how... You how, had a more simple explanation oh. for how and why people say reject the Abishter, but embrace the Rebbe. Yeah, so... so that way. Yeah, I don't yeah. want to hear that. Then we can come back to what what happened over yes, here. Yes, yes. So, so, how, so I, I did forget that that was... We got lost in the conversation, but yes. It, so, so the, the reason that... The, the, By the, the way, if I was viewing the podcast... Yeah, and we wouldn't come back to this. I'd be so annoyed. I'd be like, "He said he had a more simple. Where did it go?" Abtalachis, <laughs> abtalachis. We're not going to get to it. If you come to this podcast because you think that you're going to get satisfaction, and <laughs> <I'm gonna laughs> wrap the that was spoken in the most quintessential Lubavitcher fashion. Bro, bro, <laughs> bro. You don't pay for it. Get lost. <laughs> Phenomenal. <laughs> Phenomenal. Anyway, um, Here, you gonna uh, land it or no? Yeah, yeah, no. I go for it. I, I, I kind of lost my train of thought, but I, but yes, I, I the, the, so to me, what, what, what I was getting at is that the Rebbe became a, a kind of a possession of the masses. Now you have to be careful because you know I can imagine it wasn't the whole fight of Hey Tavis that the Rebbe belonged to the Chassidim and so on. I think that's a very delicate line, right? The Rebbe belonging to Chassidim is different to me than the Rebbe belonging to the masses. I'm talking about masses here. I'm talking about mass think, group think. The Rebbe became part of group think, group identity. And in a way that God did not. In a way that God did not. Why? Why? Because the Babshas don't have a monopoly on God. It's not their group. <laughs> it's not their group think. This is a more simple explanation? Yes, it's right. No, no, it's it's it's, it's more obvious. It's meaning it meaning it's, it's No, more, I don't think so. I think this is way less obvious well, I, and more I, convoluted. I, I, but I'm curious by it. I, it's not convoluted. <laughs> I, okay. I don't I'll tell you why I think it's convoluted, because God is is in the DNA of every Jewish person. Like, again, you're talking spiritually. I'm talking about I'm talking about so I'm talking about sociologically. Even, th- even sociologically. Feel cautious column close to earth. That's a spirit. That, that that's a that's a that's an assessment that the Rebbe makes of a yid. It's a very holy assessment. I, I'm not I'm not I'm not denying its validity. I'm not denying its truth. But when you look at when you look at, I would be quicker to say that I would question whether it's true for everyone or whether there are exceptions. But but I, I think that but the God is part is like is like part of the collective Jewish consciousness for millennia. You as a you even as they're a, not believing is a form of believing. As the old trope goes, but there's truth to it. Okay. Uh, okay that, that, anyway, that's my pushback on your take. I hear your opinion. No, no, I don't I, think it's a more simple explanation. I think I don't I, think it's a more obvious explanation. No, I, 
meaning the, the, if the problem is, let's go back to the problem. If the problem is how is it that you negate God and you somehow think that you can you can negate God or okay, you But the simple explanation God. is because you look at the horrors of the world and you attribute it to God, which is an expression of your belief in God. You go ahead and you reject that God because you ultimately believe but you hold that on to God their, has to... But hold on to because he didn't do anything bad to you. But, but, the Rebbe's, <laughs> but the Rebbe's whole status is... No, but now you're entering into, into a level of thought that a lot of people don't, don't, don't engage in. No, so I... So, okay, I hear you. That's I, what I, I think would be the most I linear, think, simple explanation. So I, think, I think the most... I think the most... Lo- what I meant was, I guess, the most logical without, without having to resort to, like spiritual understanding of people that's what i mean I, by hear, obvious. But I think it's divorced from from the collective experience i think i think i think there's a sense that i can remain a lababacher my group meaning i can remain a lababacher putting god to the side but my identity has become so inter like my my identity and my group identity has become so hardened around the rebbe that that is something I cannot, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot let go of. If I let go of that, my whole identity is to the is to the garbage. Interesting. I'm, oh, I'm, I hear I'm, what I'm, you're I'm saying. Left, I'm left with nothing. I don't think it's accurate or true, but <laughs> as the explanation. Like, but I hear, I hear. It. It's interesting. Like like it's I said, interesting. Like I said, I appreciate your honesty. Yeah. <laughs> Count on me for that. Yeah. I, it's interesting. It's interesting. I think it's a. It's interesting spin. I hear. I, 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 I think, yeah, I think, look, I think if, if, if you had, if you, if, 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 and I think we have to be, I think we have to put the opposite, an individual relationship with the Rebbe would, would necessitate a relationship with God. The, like, it if was, you're, if, I, that, that's a way to but prove that's it. Only, that's only if you're a thinker. No, no, that's not true. It, it is it, true. No, the, the, okay. Why can't you have a relationship with the Rebbe? If you like the Rebbe, Rebbe's a, a good man. If, okay, so if you, I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about the, liking the Rebbe's Spiritual humor. Spiritual teacher, I'm made a big impact in the world. Like you I'm, can, not talk, you can... I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the Rebbe and his blue eyes. I'm talking about. I'm talking about a, a, a appreciation of the Rebbe, the way the Rebbe defined what the Rebbe was, and that is it's. I don't, I, don't, I don't. I don't think that's necessarily the people who say I reject God and I embrace the Rebbe. I don't think they're tuning into. I think it's the blue eyes. Proverbially, it's not the blue eyes. It's, why, why do you care about? The, why do you? Love, why, why do you? Why do you care? Power, why do you Sarah's care passion. about that? Why do you care about that? Why are you so stiff about that? Why? Why? Why is it that so what many? Mean, here's a good guy that's so, on my so, team. So many Lubavitcher kids. Okay, let's be honest. So many Lubavitcher kids don't put on tefillin, but they go to the oil. Yeah. Why? Again, I, I I will offer you two explanations. One that I think is the pastos. And one that I think is the oymek. But what you're saying, I don't. It, it falls somewhere in between, and I feel like it falls out. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I what I, I think that on some, I I I believe either but pastos because you're saying they don't put on tefillin, but they go to the oil. I, I think somehow I sincerely believe that somehow the truth of God comes through the Rebbe for a lot of people without the. Without the trauma, without the side effect, they can they can they can connect. There's something about divinity and godliness and truth that comes through the Rebbe, where the Rebbe will be. You know what? I stand with you in my claim against God for sixteen for for in your claim against God for killing six million people. I stand with you. You have someone who stands with you, a saint, a righteous man, a tzaddik, a Rebbe, who stands with you in your in your in your claim against God. Right. Well, I mean, this, this there's nothing. I mean, this is what people need. This is what we all need on I, some level. I mean, I'm thinking, so we're not getting philosophical. You, life is hard. I'm thinking and the Rebbe is seen by a lot of people as someone who, you know, what when it comes, the Rebbe is going to be on my team. I'm thinking about it now. I'm thinking about it now. I, in many ways, I hope this doesn't sound like a backtracking. I think in many ways I am saying what you're saying in different words. So meaning it's the same kind of view, but just I guess using different vocabulary. Okay. In the sense that, like, if 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 this Lubavitch boy had been brought up with an idea of dancing a kafas with the Abishter, let's say, like like you're saying this kind of warm, then perhaps he would look at the Abishter differently, right? Because there would be this there would be this kind of warm communal experience with God that would that he would hold on to, like you said, without the trauma. Whereas 
the Eberster is, is not dancing a kafis in that literal sense. That's defini- uh, that's by definition, right? And so the Eberster ultimately is a choice that you make to basically discover for yourself, every that's we have and figure out God for himself. What do I believe? What what do I believe and how do I believe? And it's in my head. It's in my gut. It's in my soul. And it's my soul, not his soul. Right? I, I can't I'm not with the Abister with my other with my other friends by Akavis. Yes, there there are ideas of davening with a minion and and and, and serving the Abister together, but ultimately the Abister is a is a belief that you have inside you that you have to reckon with. You cannot, I don't think, fully you cannot even convince yourself that you have a group Abister. I don't think. I think it's much harder. And I think, it's, or at least, at least, at least, I think it's easier to to basically like put put away that group Abister, like you know, down with the meaning or whatever. It it's if you don't like 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 you said, it's 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 missing the humanity of or missing the warmth. Whereas the tradition of a Rebbe, I'm I'm, I'm curious because wh- whoever I've heard this thing from, right. like this is how I've heard it, or some variation of it. I mean. It's very vulgar. The Ebishter killed six million. Right. My Rebbe didn't. It's either this or some variation of that, it. That, that, that's too cheap, bro. That's too cheap. I mean, I, 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 I'm not talking about the one individual that said it, or whichever individual said it to you, the specific individual that said it to you. I don't know what his what his real things are. But, like, I bet you he drives a Mercedes Benz or a BMW. So give me an <laughs> effing break. Give me an effing break. <laughs> Give me an effing break. Like, you care so much about the Holocaust, you're ready to throw off God with your theological questions that, by the way, everybody else has. But you drive the... You know what I'm saying. Like, it's it's I, too cheap. It's, it's too cliche. It's too cliche. Like, it's it's like... It's like... And, and, and wait, so you have a problem... You, you have a problem with God who, who let the Germans kill six million Jews, or I don't know, however you phrase it. Right. But you have you're okay with the Rebbe who adamantly believes in that same God. Yeah, but the Rebbe is willing to challenge that challenge God. Challenge that God. So, what exactly are you buying into? The Rebbe's the, the Rebbe's kind of permission to do whatever the hell you want, because that's not what the Rebbe believed in. You're asking good questions. I think it's worthwhile interviewing some of these people. I'm no, serious. No, 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 but okay, fair. No, no, fair. no really. But it would no. be very interesting to interview but, some but, of these people and get and, and collect data. Yeah. <clears throat> but I, I hear what you're saying. You're trying to point out something sociological. It just it doesn't feel like the full picture. Like it doesn't explain it enough. A kid today who was never at Hakafas with the Rebbe and he, and and he's going to the oil, which is out of his way. Like right. he's, it's it it doesn't feel like your sociological observation, although there may be truth to it, kind of. Is mad to me at least. It doesn't feel like it matches the right. phenomenon. Fair enough. I mean, really, 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 in many ways, I'm. We're kind of ignoring the obvious. The obvious question, which is, your experience was in many ways fakert. At, at least from what I understood, you, you didn't drop your Yiddish guy. You dropped Chitas and Rambam. So it's a reverse. It's very right? interesting. Right? To say that. And yeah. you and you you're, you're not talking about kind of the warm hakafis or like you know fakert. You were talking about they ever being very stern and the guilt that you felt going to the oil, which, you know, so in many ways, the Yerush that you had from like the Rebbe that you received, the, 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 to, I, and I think this is a masses Rebbe that you had, was a very stern Rebbe where if you're out of line, you get whacked. Right? Right. The oil was not a place for me to come to. Yeah. It's and, not a place of love. No. No, it's not a place of love. No, 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 no. 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 The Balabas love, love is modern psychology, and for Balabatim, Balabatim are and, from, uh, and for the guy by Balabas is what? What do they say? Balabas is today. For no, 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 no. For the Balabatim of the Shluchim, you're saying for 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 Joe Shmo. Yeah, that's for the gem videos. For the guy by me. For the guy by me. But for you, right? Which also made me crazy, by the way. I couldn't conceive. At some point, I'm like, this can't be the truth. Right. A Rebbe that that has a, a like a, like a double message that smiles at these people but is angry at these people. Something about that could, couldn't. And again, if someone was, was in relationship with the Rebbe, right, it's a different story because the Rebbe had a different relationship with every person because they knew that person. But me as a post as a baby boomer, right, post Gimel Tammuz, 
trying to make sense of the Rebbe, trying to come with some kind of conceptual, to, for me to have this idea that, that the Rebbe was like, like fundamentally hiding something from some people right. and exposing things, that, that was just too crazy for me. Like, the Rebbe has to be true and be authentic and be real wherever he is. A message for him is a message for you. It's all, it had to be a cohesive picture for me. Right. So in many, way, in many ways, your experience goes against this whole conversation that we're having. Which is right. That, which is which that, has been also hard for me. Right. Because when I would go around the Babbage and I'd see people like in love with the Rebbe, and I'm like... <laughs> so you're okay with a guy who killed six million? Says, <laughs> says a dude driving a Mercedes. Yeah, man. I hear you. It, it's got to be frustrating. Look, I mean, the the the... I'm very grateful for some very loving friends. Um, I want to make special mention of Levy Greenberg. Yeah, okay. He's a good, he's a good guy. And who you've good had, guy who you've and had on the podcast. HFL alum. HFL alum. Yes, sir. What's it Homesick for Lubavitch. Oh, yeah, alum. yeah, right, right, exactly. He was on the podcast. So, and some other friends who have, who have, who have um, been a, an access point for me to be able to explore the, the traditional, you know, meaning of things, of the Rebbe, of citizen, you know, the traditional understanding of things and challenge it and ask and poke and prod and discuss and explore and pull it apart and put it back together. I've needed that. I've needed that. You know, you need to be able to, to talk to someone who kind of, rep, for me at least, I needed to find people who represent that which, which I'm struggling to align myself with, right. but, but also won't get phased by an open, honest exploration of it all, so it's a lot. It's not easy to find. How did you reclaim? How did you reclaim it? I, I understand that ultimately the fact that you did was just a choice to do it your own way. And no, the reclaiming process, first of all, is a long and arduous one and ongoing. That's number one. It's not an overnight event. I understand. I'm not looking for a quick fix, but but like, what was the change of? You, how did there ever go from being this kind of stern? stern father figure who like you know keeps you in line to being something that you could approach with a positive was it just by diluting or like no. kind of modern no, like... no 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 so i'm a coach right okay. i've been on an extensive personal journey myself i was in therapy for five years i went to school and got a degree in social work and masters because i thought i wanted to become a therapist um i've been around 12-step programs i've I've been in a lot of places, right, to, 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 to grow, to heal, to try to um, put together, you know, put, put together the pieces of my life and, and thrive. In the process of that, right, one of the most empowering contexts or ideas or schools of thought that I've encountered is that, um, and it's empowering but demanding, okay, is that, you know, the issue is not the issue. Your issue with the issue is the issue. What's that say that again? The issue is not the issue. Uh-huh. Your issue with the issue is the issue. Or said differently, you don't see, um, you don't see the world as it is. You see the world as you are. Uh-huh. In other words, a philosophy and a school of thought that introduces really the nature of subjective experience as the ultimate filter or prism through which that which is objective, so to speak, right. is coming into you. Right. Oh, similar to what the, the author ever writes in the Hakdama of Tanya, Right. Right. So there's something about the person, the constellation of variables and their psychology and their emotions and their spirituality in their being, in their person, that becomes the gatekeeper. Right. Of what comes in. So this is empowering because what that means is whether it's, you know, someone abused you, whether you, you're you upset about taxes, anything that you're upset about in the outside world, I'm upset because, which innately is a context of victimhood because that means I'm at the effect of these forces and whatever. All of a sudden now there's a context by which I can begin to look at, okay, what am I believing what are my postulates, my axioms? How am I constructed such that when I encounter this thing, it's, it's experience X and reaction Y. So first of all, I began always with a, with a core deep down desire and belief that I want to discover in a context that's wholesome. 
the idea that the truth is somewhere else is silly to me. Mm. I think the truth is always exactly where you're standing. You just have to move away from the periphery and go more to the center of it, drill deeper, get to the essence, remove the, 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 right. the, the junk. But then this helped me realize, okay, so the Rebbe's out there. I'm here hearing it a certain way. I'm here experiencing it a certain way. Where I come to Fabrengen, a bunch of chassidish guys, and I'm feeling threatened or alienated or what in the world is this about or where's the authenticity, where's, I'm reacting. Over time, I began to take more and more and more responsibility for the me in the picture, right? Mm. So it's like, I, I'm always there. So I'm therefore a variable that's shaping right. the, the experience. So this slowly, 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 I began to get more agency and access to be able to say, okay, I'm having a reaction now. I'm like, what is this Takana? Why is there? Or an Igris Kredish. I just went through Igris Kredish with someone and a letter of the Rebbe. And we literally explored exactly what my reaction would have been 10 years ago. <laughs> I'm dead serious. This would be a very interesting video to make. Exactly what my reaction would have been 10 years ago at each line and each paragraph. Uh, the Rebbe invokes a couple of soil. The Rebbe talks about all kinds of triggers and tri and how I hear it today. Uh, and it literally contrasts. But that has to do with my commitment to keep adjusting mm -hmm. and taking ownership for the meanings that I introduce into the equation that are based on my conditioning, based on my understanding, based on my current age, conceptions, you know, neural pathways, and then say, okay, so what might be, what might the Rebbe actually be, be saying? Like, could this be, what would it be like to hear this in a context that doesn't have that in a What What might it mean? What could it mean? You know, in the beginning, there's a lot of disbelief. You're like, no, 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 it can't be. Can't be, but, you know. Uh, uh, the Rebbe, there's a sikha. I remember learning with someone in Parshas Kedoshim. The Rebbe talks about Mary uh, Nishnei Hashem. If right. you give, then you get back, and if you don't, then you lose what you have. Oh, here we are. We're under threat. If we don't teach Aleph, then we're gonna. Lose. We have to. And, and I was actually learning with someone who was having that reaction, and I was like. I think the Rebbe is, is just articulating a law of the universe. Like, this is not personal in any way, but when you give, there's things that come back to you through that process. When you don't, there's things that you lose. It, it's not personal. It's not like a threat. You know, it's like if you eat three, if you eat, you'll live. If you don't eat, you'll die. And that's not personal. Right. Like the weather is not personal. So there's laws of the physical universe, laws of the spiritual universe. So this was a different way of me hearing the Rebbe talking. The Rebbe is just naming a spiritual law of the universe that's in Torah, to confirmed by the Torah. So it's not like at you. And it's none of that is really happening. But in the beginning, when people would tell me that, I'd be like, okay, stop it. I, I couldn't. Be, I couldn't even believe that that you know that that the Rebbe that that an experience of the Rebbe could be so wholesome or so pristine. It takes time. It's taken years, but slowly, slowly. It does get exponential. It does get um, you know exponentially quicker, because once you can see it in one text, you see it. In, if it takes ten years for you to see have your first breakthrough in something that the Rebbe says, it doesn't take another ten for your next one, because you have more to work with. Do you do you find now that you have changed your mindset that you see things more like, like you, you've been referring to the guys that who like it worked for them. Do you feel like you're one of them now, or it's more like it works for you on your terms? I can't say uh, I can't say that I identify uh, that I'm one of them. Mm. However, I do have a much better understanding of the world in which it works for someone. Mm. I fought very hard to try to acquire an mm. understanding of that world because. I can't walk around the world believing I have a monopoly on the truth mm. and that the masses got it all wrong. I, I'm committed to not, to not, it, it, it doesn't feel, a, it feels like that's a cheap way out. It feels like it's an easy way out because I don't have to contend then with what the masses are up to, what they're into. But 
And, and, and like for me, I'm like, no, if a bunch of people are doing this, if they're coming to Fabrengan and Fabrengan in a certain way, and they're coming to Chassidus, Shira Chassidus and talking about it in a certain way, and they're talking... There, so, some for some reason it's working for them and is it working for all of them no some of them will eventually realize it's not working for them and they'll drop out and have to go on the journey yes but i'm saying in a general sense and i worked have worked very 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 hard to understand the world mm. in which kind of all lines and makes sense they have different needs they have different sensibilities different personalities different ex- set of experiences language, conditioning, so I can see today mm. how, oh, I, I can see that. That's really beautiful. I'm happy for them. Mm. But I'm not, I can't say that I'm, I fully I slide, I slide right in. I see what you're It's saying. hard to go back into the womb, and I don't have to, and I'm not meant to. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I, I, I clearly have less faith in the masses than you do. But I, 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 I appreciate what you're saying about that ultimately there's something to respect about the masses. You know, my, my father always told me that my grandmother would say, would say a vart, that if you want to know, if you want to know if your behavior is good behavior, think if everybody around you was doing what you were doing. Like, does your behavior scale in a positive way? And, I, you know, in a certain way that could be a critique of mass behavior but it's also a critique well, I don't of, understand what that means can you explain what that like, means so in the context of our conversation you know okay so I have a problem with the masses so I am going to I'm going to learn let's say um, Sefer HaMitzvah or I'm going to not learn until I'm comfortable with it what happens if everybody does that is that better than than is that better than what's going on now is that really better you know, so, and I think you, to put it in different words, it's very easy to like poke holes at, you know, what establishment or masses, like what, what people are doing, norms. It's very easy to say, okay, well, look at this. They're just saying Rambam. They're, you know, they're, they're not learning Rambam. But like you push back, but at least, at least they're doing something. And you're like, okay, but, or I'm like, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll own it. I'm like, yeah, okay, but is that really something? Did I really consider the alternative possibilities where a world where they wouldn't be doing anything at all, which is, I think, what you were saying? Like, it's easy to take for granted that this thing exists in the first place, that there is a mass is obviously, de facto, it's just here. And the question is, why isn't it better when one can consider maybe there shouldn't have been this mass in the first place? Maybe, like, maybe, maybe the fact that it's here at all is a miracle. Mm. Right. And so, you know, that to me is the ultimate kind of pushback on on, on what I think, um, because you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of it goes both ways to me. We're like, you know, if you if you if you if you if you're too if you're too like kind of casual about dismissing the masses, it's like, what, what do you think you have a better idea? Like, like you. Things things are very hard to build. It's very hard to convince one person to do anything. To convince a lot of people to to do something at all right. is a massive undertaking. And right. you're just coming. Oh, I could do it better. Really? Could right. you, really? You could do it better. Right. Uh, hello. You know. Come on. Get real. Even um, at 36, you realize it. Yeah, but but on the other hand, I mean, Dafka at 36. I mean, I'll realize it more and more. You know, when you're younger, you're like, oh yeah. When I get older, I'll just build a billion dollar company if I want to, but I don't want to, I don't want to, so so I'm not, but if I wanted to, you know, you know, the typical, like, you know, every shlech could have been a billionaire, obviously, right? It's like, you know, and I, I also, I'm not going to blame it on others. You know, there's that kind of mentality. And I think it's a general youthful mentality of like, you know, I could, I could do whatever I want. And then the world teaches you very quickly, like, let's start with making a thousand dollars. How good are you at making a thousand bucks? Oh, it's not so easy. A billion has a few more, you know what I mean? Okay. So, so you know, I, I'm, I'm old enough at this point to know that I will only probably learn that more and more. That, like, that life is hard, right? Even the easy life in many ways that we have today, the comfortable life that we have today, at the end of the day, it's there's hardship, right? So, so to like, kind of take it for granted that there's anything at all 
that we can like poke holes in is a is in a way kind of a certain kind of conceit and a certain arrogance and that probably explains why some people get annoyed at me frankly about this podcast like bro like you know what are you just like but I feel that. But then it, it wouldn't be pop if you didn't get annoyed. But if you didn't annoy anyone, the podcast wouldn't go anywhere. No, no, I, fine. I mean, I, but I'm just saying, like, I understand why, <coughs> why, because you know, some people like, some people like to get annoyed about anything. But some people, I think, genuinely are like, you know, like, you know, you just you come and poke holes, but you, you don't really present an alternative. You don't take you don't take into account how how big of a miracle it is in the first place. And I think there's some there's some validity to that argument. There's a lot of validity to that argument. What I would say, though, is is that what I'm pushing back at and what, I, what compels me, I think, is that I, I see a lot of complacency, meaning like you had, I guess, the, the, like you said, I can accept what you're saying, that the masses indicate some value. I, what did someone once sent me a beautiful line? Um, I don't think it's that like uh, cliches, not cliches. I'm forgetting it wasn't cliches. It was a word like cliches. But like one of these things that people discard, maybe it was cliches, like they hold on to timeless truths. Like there's a way of looking at it where like the things that kind of the, the kind of things that we like, like laugh at, like, oh, everybody does that. Like everybody says that all the time. Yeah, because it's true. That's why. You're not original when you say that. Right. But but it's true. And just because it's been true from the beginning of time doesn't make it less true now. Like this, this, this need to be authentic at all at any cost. I need to be my own guy, even if it means I'm running around in my underwear. It's, you know, it gets ridiculous at a certain point, right? So you know, there, there, like you can accept the value that there is in the masses and the fact that everyone's doing it, but at the same time, I guess what 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 really frustrated me and still frustrates me is like that get, get easily becomes a cudgel of like okay shut up and get in line shut up and get in line and i think there needs to be both i think there needs to be a respect for if everyone's doing something don't think for a second that you're smarter than all of them the math the math is not on your side chances are that in this masses that you kind of make fun of there's many, many people who are far smarter than me. It's like mathematically, mathematically probably uh, f uh, certainty. It has to be, right? But at the same time, the fact that the masses are doing it doesn't mean that you can become complacent. And I want to add meat on that bone. Okay. Just to make it a little richer. Go ahead. Um, besides for the for the... There's a first of all, there's a quality of humility, right? In considering the value inherent in whatever the masses are up to and the way they're structured. Second of all, is there's a uh, a quality of which there's two sides of the same coin of like I guess like intellectual like or honesty, right? Like, like let's be honest. Like, can I honestly say I know better than a thousand people? Like, is right. it honest? Forget about whether it's humble. Or arrogant. Is it honest? So there's an element of humility to open yourself up first, like emotionally. Then there's an element of honesty. And then eventually you discover, you, you may even discover, right? Instead of just believing and trusting that it's there, you may even discover its value. Now, at this, but I want to point something out that it's not just like, okay, the masses certainly has a collection of plenty of people that are brighter than me in, in, in terms of IQ or whatever. It's something else, which I think gives more permission for us to simultaneously acknowledge, appreciate and respect and honor whatever is going on on the mass level and simultaneously cherish and celebrate and hold sacred the individual path yeah. that may not converge with, with, right. with the best. And what that is, is because it's ultimately, it's not really a, a question of intellect. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not a question of intellect. It works. The masses work the way they work because of what, what I would call, I, I, we're just going to use this for now. I would call level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Someone can be insanely bright, but the question is really, um, what the, which, uh, how sensitive are they to the various um, aspects and elements 
of consciousness itself, of reality. Like how open are they to like the totality of, of, of life? You have someone who's not very brilliant, but creative, sensitive, feels more of the textures of like of this of like life consciousness in the world. And then you have someone who's absolutely brilliant, but like intellectually and conceptually, but but like not nowhere nearly as earthy or nor nearly as sensitive as nor nearly as connected to some to some to some you know to context to the implicit versus only the explicit to creativity to art like so i think that the the way the masses are constructed does that make sense what i'm saying or should yeah, i explain no, that a little more i mean it makes i think i think i understand what you're saying i think the masses are constructed in such a way it's super super so they can be in Rishayim. like you you there's a certain wholesomeness that comes from the fact that we have to live with other people because when 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 you when you live with different points of view there there is a a wisdom that comes out of the coalescing of those different points of view that doesn't exist on an individual level an individual an individual no matter how brilliant can get carried away with their kind of tunnel vision but i'm trying to say the opposite you're saying the opposite i'm saying the opposite i'm saying that masses work because of something on a on a on a more subconscious level because there's because there's because because as long as you deal in the same, the masses work based on currency. There's a currency that everyone in the mass is dealing in. So even though some of them might be more brilliant than you, but there's a core currency that they think in, a core currency that they experience in, you say, uh, and therefore it works. The one person that uh, comes along and says, I see what you're saying. I, 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 well, this is copper. This you're, is copper coins. Saying, I, need, I want a silver coin. I want a silver coin. It's not a question of whether he's brighter or, or not as bright. He he's looking to experience life and engage with life, mm. like in a different currency. You're saying you're saying I think that like other the when you say the answers, the more questions that you say the answers, the bigger proof that it's true. Right, they have pointed that out. Right? right. So like if if this thing as you said has been accepted by many people, then then that's a certain testament to its truth the fact that so many people are able to engage with this truth where right is that what you're saying they get that again that's a yeah word but i'm also but i'm also pointing out that you have someone that comes along an individual but what what happens if the if the masses are are let's say they decide that uh, you know the famous story where the guy ends up in the in the city where where we're rotten where like cheese is currency or that fish is currency because they have too much gold Right or you know like masses do go mad. That's my point. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to distinguish that that masses work because everyone is dealing in the same currency. Some people in the masses have a hundred dollars in their bank account. Right. Other people have a million dollars in their bank account. Other people have one cent, and other people are in debt. But they're all dealing in the American currency. I'm using this metaphor. It's a little bit of an abstract idea. Comes along some individual and says, Bitcoin. Bitcoin. <laughs> now, it, it, it could very well be that in the masses who are dealing in dollars, they're, they're geniuses. Far smarter than him. It has nothing to do. It's, it's no, it's, it doesn't have nothing to do with it. This guy deals in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. This is how he knows the world. This is how he knows reality. This is how he experiences consciousness. So then, he, he's doing. He's dealing in a different currency. So that's what I mean to say by. Well, what if he thinks that everyone else is is in a, engaging in a false, made up currency? That's a mistake. That he needs to work through. But that's what I'm trying to you, say. You pissed off every Bitcoin guy just now. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> or in the muscle, maybe it's not right. I don't know anything about that stuff in the muscle. But in the nimshal, that's exactly the point. Masses are not only, it's not only a function of humility to respect the masses. It's not only a function of honesty to respect the masses. But moreover, it's perfectly plausible. Like, masses work because everyone's dealing in the same currency. But some people's minds and hearts perceive I don't, I, I, that through a different currency. And therefore, they are going to discover and experience 
life and truth through that unique prism. It doesn't mean that they can't associate with the masses, but that's why individual is absolutely important and needed, and masses are perfectly good and work. Uh, so I thought you were saying something else. I, I, I actually, I don't, I think you're, I think that's your weak, your weaker argument for masses, because I, I think I think that very quickly in the nimshal becomes, you know, there is a madness of the crowds. Um, people gravitate as masses to the, very often to the flashiest, easiest, most available thing, which kind of gains traction and, and develops a power and momentum of its own. That in itself... Well, that's the unique that, of and, masses. And, and I'll tell you, on a deeper level, yeah, but on a deeper level, that pits the masses against individual because that that that, that becomes very quickly a numbers game and a power struggle. All the, all the masses do it. Uh, so I have to, if I don't play ball with them, if I don't engage in their currency... Uh, you know, I, I I cannot I cannot buy I cannot put bread on the table, but what if they're taka delusional? What if they're taka wrong? The fact that everyone the, the whole point of either guy supposedly and not supposedly absolutely is echad Avram, Avranar, Avram Avri. Like if you believe that that what the world is doing is wrong, then you don't care that the whole world's doing it. Screw the masses. So the fact that the masses are doing something, I don't think in itself is 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 the, is is a proof. I, I thought what you were saying, and what you've been saying earlier, is that is that the masses aren't idiots. Meaning, meaning there's a certain truth that comes, a certain wisdom that comes from the masses. Meaning, it's not the vart that because of the masses, therefore you must listen to them. It's more because so many individuals came to this recognition. There must be something there. Yes. But the, the, so I'm I'm splitting hairs. No, not really. But that's what I'm saying. Okay, fine. fine. But, but what's uh, there? But what's there works for them. One second. One second. That's so, where so, the currency so, piece no, comes. No, in. So, so, let, so let so let me let me let me let me let me just let me just finish the thought. You tell me if you agree. I think the ultimate Evan Abayin is is a masses a collection of individuals or not, right? In other words. Is the masses in opposition to the individual or not? Can the masses tolerate an individual or not? Right? No, but that's a very mistaken question. One, to so, ask. So, one second. If it cannot, if it cannot, I'm not, I'm not saying it can't. If I care, I'm saying if it cannot, then we are talking a brute numbers game. And we're talking about a masses that, that basically wins by, by strength, but not by, not by truth and not by, not, not, not legitimately. Right. But, how do we know that a masses is legitimate? How do we know that masses is worth taking seriously, and that they're, they're, they're that they're fighting for the truth, when they are open to individual thought, when they when they them when the masses itself is yes from the outside it looks like a blob of people that are all wearing black hats, and they all look the same, but when you talk to them individually, they're thinking for themselves, and they're and they're. If we're talking, if we want to go back to the relationship with the Rebbe, they have they're 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 finding their own line, they're finding their own language, they're finding their own connection that 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 makes sense to them. Like if you're if when you zoom in, you find individuals. Who cares that they look like that that there's mass behavior there too? That could be a beautiful thing. That could be a very powerful thing, right? So in other words, what I what 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 I think I'm gaining from this conversation, or like kind of the takeaway for me is. To negate the masses in itself is a mistake, right? A because it exists, just to write it off as ridiculous, and B because what do you think? It's it's just there. It's just a, a like a like a fluke. Like there's there's a reason why it's there, and to not to disrespect it is just pure hubris. But at the same time, at the same time, the 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 the, 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 the one one must be vigilant. Not that I'm like the watch guard for the masses, but for oneself, one must be vigilant that the masses never overpowers his own individuality. Beautifully and said. It, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Okay, so we're coming somewhere. You know, if if the if 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 the masses, if the pressure of the masses is making you feel that you must relinquish your individuality, then you are in a toxic relationship with the masses. You, you know, you have. Either you, like you said earlier, like your interpretation, your issue with the issue is the issue. Your conception of the masses has gone toxic, or you have now you have engaged with the masses on its toxic side because it's not all perfection. 
you have you have you have gotten involved with the masses in the wrong place, and you have to disengage. And a lot of people do, right? No, but I'm saying I'm saying, but but not because masses in itself is a bad thing, Correct. but because the relationship here is broken, and you must disengage from that relationship and reengage in a positive way. I think that's very eloquently said. Without without right acknowledging the the side effect that some some individual can get caught up in a dist- particular destructive element symptom of masses right yeah that's true right I, mean, I think it's I think it's I think it's valid I think it's beautiful and and I guess you're being a voice for people to kind of if that's what's happening just being a voice for them giving them permission to be able to reevaluate that relationship and 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 work things out for themselves. I mean, look, we're we're already down that rabbit hole. I, I'm not I'm not trying to be a voice for anybody. Maybe because I'm a selfish bastard, but <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not like it. It's not trying to be a voice for the voiceless. Yada yada. To me, it's to me, it's 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 much more personal than that. Okay, it's almost like. I think I told someone. I mean, I could. I don't know if I said it on the podcast, but like, I need to. In many ways, this podcast is um, like almost. And I guess, I guess that now, if you're still listening, maybe, maybe it's kind of fitting that I've been a little bit more open on this episode because it is the thirtieth episode. So, oh, congratulations! Congratulations, Lekayach. You know, I got this. No, but I mean, you know. What's the like? What's what's like the motivation? In many ways, it's I was I was faced and still am faced with a with a question of can I can I coexist with the with this masses? Not just other people, but with the masses. You know, what I mean, like the, the the idea that my behavior is in many ways affiliated with others. Or like very like identical and like you know exactly what we're talking about like like that like I, I I dress a certain way because other people do I say this because you know and I speak a certain way because other people speak that way and like you know the can I can I even the healthy part of being part of masses part part of the masses and and kind of just doing things like everyone else is doing you know can I can I coexist with that in a in a in a in a healthy way that's the question that i need to answer for myself not for anybody else not that you know the fact that you're all listening to me do this in public you know hopefully hopefully whatever journey i'm on or whatever questions i'm asking are of some value to you right if you're listening but i just want to say that i think can you do it in a healthy way i would just say that i think the ultimate health is the capacity to remain identified with the masses on some level, to see the value and the beauty in the masses while simultaneously retaining and celebrating your individuality. Right. So that, I that, think that is health. It takes a while to get there. Right. It's not easy. In the beginning, we experience it as a war, as a fight between individual and mass. But I believe, and it's been my experience, through work, through humility, through honesty, through personal responsibility for your experience, you could get to that place where it's like, I love these people. This is, yes, there's so much beauty and I identify with these masses and I'm still me. I'm me. I think a little differently. I feel a little differently. I act a little differently. Right. And these are still my people. And these are still my people. Yeah. Conceptually, I agree with you that the, I started off this podcast asking myself if that's possible, right? Like, because very often when we see the masses from afar, yes. And still today, when I see from afar, I'm like, there's no way in hell that it works. <laughs> I mean, I can convince myself stuff, but like, I don't, I just, don't, I, you know, not that I am angry at these people and I, I don't have friends, but it's like, I cannot, I cannot, you know, I don't know if I'll have the, if I would have, ha- if I would have the guts to kind of go completely away, but like, Am I going to raise my kids this way? Like, I, I don't, like, I don't relate to this from afar. But as I, as I, as I began to speak to people and I made an effort to not only speak to people that are quote unquote, like skeptical or on the outside, but people, I mean, look at the list. It's, 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 it's up and down the gamut. Like it's people that are core and people that are outside looking in. It's every, you know, 
it's it's and everyone in between. You know what I've learned is is that there's a lot more, and maybe I was naive for thinking otherwise, but the amount of people listening to this podcast would indicate that a lot of people are also surprised. There's a lot of individuality that's been submerged. You know whether it was conscious or just so happened by circumstance, a lot of individuality and individual thought and individual expression that's been. I don't know if it's submerged or just unknown to the public. And as you kind of start exploring and talking to people, you find that not people are thinking for themselves. People have ideas. People have personalities. People have disagreements. People people are people. People have their, own, their, their lives, their families, their visions, their experiences, what they like, what they don't like, what they enjoy, their memories. People are people. And they even the people that are quote-unquote core, hardcore masses, let's say, even they have their own interpretation of what that is. And as you as as I have seen that more and more with my own eyes and heard that more and more with my own ears, it's allowed me to understand how that tension, how, how those two seeming opposites coexist. Yes, there there is a sense that in a growing community that's gotten so big, when you when you when you see it as one monolith, you kind of rub away so many of the individual distinctions because by definition to bring so many people under one tent you kind of have to forget it seems like you have to forget about a lot but that's only because we don't insist on finding that individuality both in ourselves and in others and you know i think in many ways not i i I managed to not expect the conversation to go this way i didn't expect it not to go this way uh, I had a long day. I wasn't. I wasn't expecting Bukhal to stay up this long, but you know, I'm very happy that in this conversation we kind of got there. Um, you know, I, 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 I think, I think you pushed back on on some of my kind of, you know, like, 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 you know, um, you know, my, my, my. You, you, we, we had good, we had good, we had good back and forth, you know, and and I think, I think you moved me a little bit here. Like, I think you, you pushed my position a little bit. Not that you were trying to, but I, I, like I felt it challenged, and I think I think it, it's kind of a nice like sickum in many ways of there's a tension there between the masses and the individual, and I don't think there's like someone asked me like no so you, did you answer your question that you started that you that you were looking for and I'm like no what I learned was there's no freaking answer, but the question is for sure worth asking. Yeah, and and <coughs> excuse me. I appreciate this conversation very much. I appreciate you and your Thank thoughtfulness you. and 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 it's been very very refreshing to have this conversation whether I agree or disagree, you know, with with the way you formulate your ideas. Clearly you're a thoughtful person thinking for yourself or bringing your own formulations, your own articulations to some of these questions or some of these issues and and really not not um uh, uh, what's the word? Not like a shrinking, right? Or falling away from asking the question and from exploring the possibility of of of, of what those answers might be. And yeah, I really acknowledge you. I appreciate the podcast and and this conversation was great. Thank you. And 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 I I trust that that this conversation, everything that you've shared, and as well as what I've shared, becomes some kind of access point for. For people it becomes a voice. I know that you only think about yourself. You don't think about <laughs> anyone else, and you're the most horrible person around. I didn't say that. Oh, okay, good. I didn't say that. Okay, good. I didn't say that. I didn't say the most horrible. It felt person. like that. No, I didn't say the most horrible person. I just, I, I, I don't, I don't, I, I, you know, not the best person. I'm not, I'm not looking to ascribe to myself motivations that I don't need to ascribe to myself. No, I hear you. I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. And people listen to this, and and it's valuable. I trust that. I trust that people will, will get what they need out of this and, and it'll be an opening for them, for people. Yeah, I just want to, that, that last thing, I, it's not that I'm worried, like, on Nivis, like, I, I don't do it for other people. It's more, if I have these conversations on behalf of other people and not on behalf of myself, to me, that's a very untrustworthy barometer of where to go and what to ask and how to think. Because, oh, what, you know, it, it's not for the sake of being honest, but if you're not going to be honest and, and 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 direct about what, then 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 it's a very I don't know if the word's dangerous, but it's 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 very loose and un, like untethered, right? 
like at, at some point at some point there has to be some kind of bikush like something that you're trying to get at and if it's just what other people for, might for be Yana, right. what Continue might be thinking right. what might be thinking okay who knows what they're right. thinking right this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm. Well, thinking. that's that's what makes these conversations so rich. You bring right. that ferociousness to it. Of, you know, this is about me. <laughs> right. So it has to be about you. No. If, if people gain from it, does it not? Does it not gratify me? Does it? Is it not something that I'm very proud of? Of course it is. It's not that I'm not trying to claim I don't care about other people, or, you know, when people reach out, you know, and the people listening still listening after God, two and a half hours. God bless you all. But um, I'm saying, you know, people listening, you know, and and they many people reach out. And then more don't, but you know, I, the word gets back to me. And of course, it's of course it's touching. That's why I do it. Uh, it's it's time, it's money, it's effort. It's you know, it's not always. It's, I mean, I enjoy talking to you immensely, and I usually enjoy the I always enjoy the conversations. But getting to the conversations and making the time is not sure. always. It's a big commitment. Yeah, and, I, and a lot of the reason I'm motivated is because of that kind of feedback. But ultimately, the the the, the question has to come, in my opinion, for this kind of conversation has to come from myself and I so I don't want to blame it on others I don't want to kind of oh I'm doing this for other people no no I'm doing it for myself and I have to own up to that but anyway I, I appreciate you making the time I know we went well over time than we than we dis- originally discussed uh, it's been a wonderful conversation and at the very least in 10 years you can look back and <laughs> have a good laugh and God willing God willing that that laugh will be around and be even more hearty and and, and and deeper and I'll be able to laugh and we should have good times. Yeah, we should we should you know we should we should we should have uh, you should you should have and we should all have and everyone listening should have um, you know simchas and uh, and the nachas and uh, and uh, good times. Nachas happily die. Yeah. God bless you, man. Have a good night. All right. The music for this podcast comes from the album Repentance Doors by Oren Sor Nadav Bachar and is used with their permission. <laughs>